Hey everybody, uh, welcome back again. So soon it'll be 6 p.m. Um, on this day, Thursday, May the um, 14th. So we've got our review session lined up for tonight. Uh, that's the plan. We're gonna go over our study guide and get ready for next week's final. So to all uh, who are watching now or anytime later, um, greetings, welcome back. Hope you guys have been doing well and um, yeah, just get yourself situated. Make sure that you have the study guide pulled up um, so that you can refer to the questions as we're going through them and stuff. And uh, we'll just go in whatever order you guys want, cover the material one last time, and then you'll be good to go for your, um, for your upcoming test next week. And that's really it for the class. So appreciate you guys' hard work all semester. <clears throat> okay, I'm just keeping my phone set to important emails coming in from all you guys make sure i'm capable of replying in real time but there's still a few minutes till it's six so anyways no rush but thanks as always for your guys time <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> awesome. Anybody that's here, feel free to say hello. It's always good to see uh, who's there and also just to hear from you guys. So don't be shy. <clears throat> How really could you be when you're in your own house, chilling? So there's no need to be shy anymore. I can understand if you're in a classroom, you've got a bunch of people out there, but this takes some of the pressure off, maybe too much in a way, because people don't have the same ability or desire to attend all the meetings synchronously, but, but you guys have been pretty good throughout the whole semester, so I'm not really referring to you. <clears throat> <clears throat> long semester for everybody but uh, hopefully you guys don't just you know drop the baton right there next to the finish line you gotta still get to the end you know it's like a race you can't stop halfway even if you ran the fastest possible time for like three quarters of the race, you still got to cross that finish line. So hopefully you save some energy for that last that last leg. Hi, Michael. Good to see you. Um, good evening. <clears throat> Jen, yes. Uh, do not worry about how long it is. That's fine. I, I meant to say that before. I think I maybe mentioned it that going over the minimum is fine, but going beneath is not as good. So don't worry about that, that's totally okay. And um, sent the essay to the correct email, oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let's see here. Cool. Did you though? Because to be honest with you, Michael, I don't have your essay. When did you send it? Uh, yeah, like, but not not a big deal. But fundamentally, though, where is your essay? No, I don't have it. You just sent it? Okay, maybe it's still coming through. But I have not seen it. 
When did you send it? Okay. I'm getting essays from a few others. I'm glad that I got you right here so that in case there's a problem with the delivery, we could just sort it out in real time. When you see me on my phone like this, that's just me telling students that are submitting their essays, thank you, just giving them a confirmation of receipt. And so I'm doing that for each person that's giving to me. Hello, everybody. Hi there. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I don't know, um, Michael, what the situation is. Yeah, <laughs> you've had an email issue before. Um, hi, Shauna. I got your paper. Uh, so, do you? I mean, is there anything I can I help you somehow to to send this thing to me? Go back, see, make sure that you're typing in the uh, email address correctly without any errors, because even just one letter off, obviously, it won't come through. <clears throat> Okay, well, um, to everybody here, I see that it's six o'clock, so welcome everyone. Um, great to have you back. Um, thanks for your time and for all of your hard work throughout the semester, and it's been a semester unlike anything else. Um, let me look at what you're saying here, Michael. It says sent. I clicked on the link that you included with your email address on your recent email to us. Um, I don't know, Michael. Um, other people are sending it to me, uh, and I'm getting those, but I don't have anything from Michael Hernandez. Uh, Our to OCC.CCCD.EDU. Yes, that is correct. Um, let's see. Finally, it's coming. Okay, thanks so much. Got it. Not to worry, Michael, but better safe than sorry, because we had a little delivery issue in the past. Perfect. It came through. I guess, you know, probably there's a... Uh, a lot of activity on these servers and stuff, um, you know, so that could possibly be it. But not to worry, got your paper, perfect. Okay, so everybody here, like I was trying to say, uh, thanks for being here. It's the last face-to-face, uh, -face, well, not really face-to-face, -face, but last time you're gonna see my face, uh, because next week you just have the final exam, and you're gonna take that final exam the same way that uh, you took the midterm, which is I'll send you the test form, right uh, before class time, and then you guys will have the whole three hour period, however much at that time you want, to complete some answers from the study guide and then return it back to me by email. So um, don't forget that your second essays are due tonight. Um, I've received you know, many of them, but I don't think I've received all of them for all the students that are in the class. So uh, I'm not gonna be strict in terms of if it comes to me tonight, you know, I'll be flexible enough to not deduct credit for things that show up this evening. In my perfect world, they would all have been given to me by six, but um, in this actual world, it's not perfect at all. Uh, I'm not too worried about it. So yeah, I could give you guys a little more time, but it's if it comes to me tomorrow, then I will start to take away a little credit. Um, so if any of you guys are scrambling to finish, just I'll permit you a couple of additional hours, uh, but um, for the most part, that's it. Once once midnight, like Cinderella, the carriage turns into a pumpkin, as they say, and uh, that's when late credit's gonna start coming off. But it will be a minor deduction, so I don't wanna discourage you, if you cannot finish it tonight, from turning it in late tomorrow, because the deduction will only be of a third of a grade for each additional day late. And I would prefer for you to turn in something late and get a little deducted credit than to just get a zero on the assignment, which would, of course, not help your overall score. But, uh, you know, you've had the prompts for several weeks, and I know that everyone's busy and philosophy's hard to write about, but, you know, everything's hard in life, right? Just trying to survive. So uh, this is probably the least of your worries. But anyway, um, welcome back. If you did not have a chance to, I would ask everybody now to simply take out that study guide. Um, the study guide has all the questions that I'm gonna use for uh, the final. I'm not gonna, of course, ask all of them. Just like with the midterm, you have a big list and I'm gonna take a set of questions off of the list. So in the list I gave you guys, which I've also got here on my phone, um, there's a total of uh, 84 questions, but some of them we did not get to. Basically the last uh, four we didn't really get to cover. So it's actually just uh, the 80 questions on the list. The first 38 uh, of them, 
were from prior to the midterm and the 42 that come after that are all the stuff that follows from after the midterm. So we had one review session earlier. That was our last in-person meeting um, where we all went over the study guide as a group. Now um, it's our time to do the, I guess, second half of the study guide. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I always get these allergies when my cat's coming too close to me. But Back to what I was asking. Um, let's go through the study guide, yeah? So what do you guys prefer? Do you just want to like run through the list in an order, um, like from beginning to the end? Is that your preference? If if you want to do it in any other type of way, that's fair too. But we have plenty of time, so got nothing but time, and we can go over every question. Um, so all right, cool. I get a little feedback from you. Try and uh, give your own, um, you know, responses too. I, I'm going to try and you know direct us to. Um, the right kind of information. I'm going to try and make sure that everything that gets put forward here in the meeting is is accurate and uh, you know faithful to the text. Uh, yes, sounds great. So anyway, let's do that then. Um, so as I ask a question, I'll just tell I'll I, I'll ask all of you what do you know about this question and what information would you give, and then I'll sort of see the responses that the students generate. And then I'll summarize um, the best response using some of the information that you guys give me. All right, so let's go ahead and look at 39, which is the first one on the second half of this study guide. So the study guide starts with the topic of epistemology and the theory of knowledge. Um, so what does 39 say? It says, explain Socrates' example of the statues of Daedalus. Okay, so put on that thinking cap and just let's get that going. Um, Statues of Daedalus, anybody? What was the analogy that the author Plato was making in that um, example? What was the statue thing all about? If you give me something to go from, then I'll take you, um, you know, to the promised land with the information. But I just need a little bit of support from you so that I can just uh, check in that you have a familiarity with the concept and some, any level of understanding. Okay, so Shauna, the, the statues were so realistic that they could run away. Yes, that was the myth. So what did people think that you should do if you got one of the statues? So Cher, you say the ropes. The ropes are to the statue as justification is to knowledge, that it secures it. Good. That's right. So <clears throat> Plato's having a little discussion here, or, well, his teacher Socrates is discussing this with Mino. What's knowledge and why is correct opinion better than just knowledge, or why is knowledge better than just a correct opinion? Um, so what Socrates said was, think about these mythical statues. Daedalus was a famous sculptor. He made very realistic looking sculptures of people. And they said that if you got one of those sculptures, you should attach it to the ground with ropes. Because if you didn't, the lifelike realism of the statues, they thought that they would just come to life or something when you weren't looking and run off. So you should get the ropes because the ropes make sure that the beautiful statue stays with you. Now, a correct opinion with no evidence behind it is sort of like one of these statues without ropes. You've got it for now, and that's great, but because it's not based on anything, it might just leave, in this case, your mind. So when you believe things, even if they're true, but you have no evidence behind that belief, it's something that you don't retain. It's something that you either forget or that you end up changing your mind about because you never really had any facts to base it on in the first place. So having justification added to your correct opinion is better because it makes sure that it stays with you and it stays in your mind. Having the ropes for these statues is better than not because it makes them stay on your property. So ropes are like justification. The statue is like a true belief without justification. Add the ropes, add the justification, and it's better. Uh, in the case of knowledge, the justification turns it from just being a co correct opinion and converts it into knowledge, which is more stable and lasts longer. Okay, so I'm just giving you all everything I could think about about that information on that question. So we're going to the next one. All right, no, number uh, 40. Explain the classical account of knowledge. So you probably remember that this classical account of knowledge has three main um, components. So just help me with that. The classical definition of knowledge, they said that knowledge was uh, was what? There's these three words, 
that are used to define knowledge? And if you could just tell me what those three words are, then we can go from there. So you just follow in your notes. If you've taken notes, then if you're going back to where we talk about um, the theory of knowledge, you'll just see all this stuff. You should. Um, so anyway, knowledge, definition, what could that be? Many of you might have written a paper about it. Okay, good, Sherry. Justified true belief. Um, so you would have to maybe say, you know, what each of those words means. You have to get a little deeper, you know. So um, what is it for a statement to be true? It's for the statement to match the facts of reality. Like if I told you I was wearing glasses, true, because I am. But if I told you I'm wearing a hat, false, because I'm not. So I made two statements. One of them matches the situation that's really happening, and the other one does not. So one is true information and one is false. True statements are the ones that mirror and reflect reality correctly. So anyway, that's truth. What's a belief? Belief is when a person thinks that a proposition or a statement is true. And people can have different beliefs about the same statement. Like maybe one person says, um, the earth is flat, and another person says, no, it's not. So they don't agree on the statement. One thinks it's true, the other doesn't. Um, obviously in life, if you could, you'd want to only believe true things because believing false things means you're getting it wrong. Uh, you have a false idea of what's really true. You're getting, um, you know, you're, you're imagining or thinking the world is a certain way, but it's actually not. Uh, and then justification, what is this? Well, we kind of mentioned it just now. It's having evidence or good reasons to back up your um, belief. So the Greeks said that for you to know something, all three have to be there. You gotta believe it, but it has to really be true. And then you gotta have evidence. So, I mean, if you filled out a question on a test and you gave the wrong answer, then you did not know it, right? Like if you said that America was founded in 1850, that's not true. So that would not be knowledge. Um, if you filled in that it was founded in 1776, but you're just guessing, then you actually didn't know it either. You just had a lucky guess. So when you fill it in confidently because you got the right answer, but also you know the reason why it's the right answer, that's when you actually have the knowledge. Okay, so that's justified true belief, classical definition of knowledge. Um, all right, so next it's uh, 41. That's asking you, how did Mr. Uh, Edmund Gettier try to show that um, justified true belief is not knowledge? All right, so for that question, you'd have to report on at least one of the Gettier cases, you know, because he gives these very detailed hypothetical scenarios uh, which are meant to show that a justified true belief can exist and still not be knowledge. So help me understand at least one of the cases. Maybe we'll just speak about the first one, I guess, at least, because that's the most um, widespread understood one. Smith and Jones are who? What are they doing? Tell me about Smith and Jones, Gettier case one. That's the kind of info you would want to report for this question if it was selected. Smith and Jones job uh, hunt, yeah. So give me some facts about it if you can, Sherry, or anybody else. I would love it uh, if you could just give me some information about Smith and Jones job hunt. How did it go? You know, who got the job? Uh, what was Smith thinking throughout the whole process? Give me a few things to say about the Smith and Jones job hunt. You told me one thing, they're applying for a job, great, okay. Then what? <clears throat> they applied for a job. Okay, Michael. Uh, so Jones owning a Ford is the other Gettier case. Uh, we can talk about that in a moment. Um, yes, Michael, we can talk about that, but that's we're getting the two cases now confused. I wanted to talk about the job hunt first. The other one about Barcelona and Brown, his other friend, that's, that he doesn't know where he is, that's a separate case. So let's, uh, let's focus first of all on the job hunt, if you, if you can, all right? No problem, skipped over a whole bunch of stuff. Let's go back, 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 back. Smith and Jones are applying for a job. What happened after they did their interviews? So uh, I'm still not hearing what I need to hear about what happened after the interviews. Let's not go too fast. Because you're telling me that he says Jones will get the job and Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. Yes. 
But why does he believe that? You can't go and just jump right over that. That's, that's the major thing. Why does he believe that? The boss told him that Jones will get the job. Good, Shauna. The boss goes over to Smith and he says, excuse me, Smith, I'm going to give this job to Jones instead of you. Okay. So he takes that and he takes that to be true. The other thing is, what about the coins? How this coin stuff get in the, in the mix? So Sherry, we got the thing about Smith was told Jones is getting. Okay, good. But there's more. Also, what else? There's something having to do with coins, but we got to say specifically what that is. <clears throat> so just let me know about the coin thing. You remember it, right? I mean, because you told me that the boss came in and says Jones getting the job, so I think you would know then what happens after that. So, um, Shauna, you say that the boss mentioned that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket? No. Uh, that's not correct. The boss doesn't have any thoughts at all having to do with coins in anybody's pocket. The boss is just conducting job interviews. Smith, though, kind of went off the rails and asked Jones, can I count the coins in your pocket? So Smith himself counted the coins in the other applicant's pocket, and he counted that there were 10. So, Sherry, that's the correct one. Okay, so let me just take us to where we were at right now. Smith and Jones applied for a job. After the interviews, the boss told Smith, I will hire Jones. Okay, also, um, he counts the coins in Jones' pocket, and he notices that there's 10 of them. So he deduces from this what belief? The belief that the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket. So you have to be clear about why he believes that. He believes it because of the two pieces of info I gave you that the boss tells him and he counts those coins. So he did. He does therefore form the belief that the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket. Then there's this little plot twist ending. So what happens after that in the end? Surprise ending. Who would have thought? But actually what happens in the end is what? you got to tell me how the story ends. We're almost there. Just need a little bit more info at the end. What's that last little item? The boss says, just kidding, Smith. Surprise, I actually am going to give you the job. Okay. There's this one little extra twist. We got that. Okay, surprise, who gets the job is actually Smith. Smith gets the job. And... And also, <laughs> he gets the job, okay, but also, what else? <clears throat> and he has 10 coins in his own pocket, yes, which he did not know about, which he had not counted, and so he was not aware. So let's then ask about his belief. The belief that he got was, the man who has the, the, the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket, right? And we told you why he believed that, and he was justified to believe that. Does it turn out to be true? Well, yes, because the reality in the end is the man who gets the job is Smith. And also, Smith has 10 coins in his pocket also. So does it uh, turn out to be true that the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket? Yes, Smith did believe it, and he was justified. So it is a JTB. It's a justified true belief. But it's not knowledge, because to have knowledge, you can't just get it right because of a random lucky coincidence. And this is what that is. Uh, it's just a coincidence, isn't it, that he counted the coins in someone else's pocket, and then unbeknownst to him, he happened to have the same amount, and he gets a job that he thought he was not actually going to get. So though he had a true belief based on evidence, it's not the right kind of evidence to give him knowledge. Um, and there are other Gettier cases too. So the other one uh, that you were trying to talk about, Michael, has to do with um, Smith, in another case, believes that Jones, his coworker, owns a Ford car because he comes to work in a Ford and he tells everybody, that's my car. So he believes Jones owns a Ford. That's justified. Now, the way that or statements work, which are called disjunctions, if even one of the two or statements is true, then the whole thing is true. So like if I tell you that either I'm wearing glasses or um, – or the moon's made of cheese, that's true because I am wearing glasses. So the false part, the second part, doesn't really affect the truth of the statement because it doesn't claim both. It just says one or the other. 
So anyway, because of that, since Smith already is justified in believing that Jones owns a Ford, he's justified in believing that either Jones owns a Ford or anything. So he just randomly forms this belief. Either Jones owns a Ford or Brown, which is his friend that he does not know where he is, is in Barcelona. He has two others also. Um, but also Brown is just coincidentally in Barcelona. So the second believed proposition is actually true. Smith believed it and he had reasons. But yet again, there's a mismatch between his evidence and reasons and the actual fact that made it true. Um, one last example. You're driving down the road. You look over to your right. You see what looks to all appearances to be a barn. So you say right then and there, there is a barn over there. Now, what you looked at, let's suppose, wasn't a barn. It looked like one, but it's actually just a very cleverly constructed art piece, which is just like a wall that appears from a roadway to be a barn. But, okay, plot twist, behind the wall, there actually is um, a real barn, okay? So in that case, the individual who believed there's a barn there had a true belief, and there was evidence to support that. But do they really know that there's a barn over there? I don't think so. And that's the conclusion to reach because it was a belief they would have formed based on the facade, not the real barn. I heard another one of these Gettier cases that's kind of like a, a COVID-19 you know, era uh, version, which is kind of funny. So suppose someone was like zooming and um, you know how you can like make the background be whatever you want? So like what if somebody uh, put up a background that's like, it's like their actual house? Um, then everyone would believe they're looking at their house and that would be true or that that's what their house looks like, I guess, whatever. And that would be a true belief and it would be, be, be based on the visual evidence coming from the video feed, but they wouldn't really know it because they were looking at the wallpaper version of it instead of the actual thing, you know, whatever, lots of examples, but they're all obey a common theme and logic that someone is brought to believe something true based on evidence that's different from what really made it true. Okay, cool, so I'm gonna keep moving. I wanted us to be clear about that because sometimes people get confused on the Gettier cases. All right, so next it says, um, what does it mean for one proposition to entail another? Maybe you could just help me with that. So say that there's two statements um, and the first one entails the second, like call them A and B. A entails B. What does that mean logically about A and B? If A is a statement and B is a statement and A entails B, then what do you think that means? A entails B. What's the logical relation between a proposition and a further one which is entailed by the first? Maybe you could even give an example if you want of two propositions where the first one logically entails the second. So let's see what you got in your mind. <clears throat> entailment. Just tell me about that. If a statement entails another statement, what does this mean? Something about the word true. But just help me understand, what does that mean? Yes, so with entailment, if A entails B, then if A is true, B must be true as well. Okay, like um, I'm in California, right? Does that entail that I'm in the United States? Tell me, yes or no. Being in California, does that entail being in the US? What do you say? That's a yes or no question. So you could just think about it for like a minute and well, not a full minute, <laughs> hopefully a few seconds and tell me what you think. I'm in California, statement one. I'm in the United States, statement two. So the first one, does that entail the second? Yes, because to be in California, you have to be in the United States because it's a part of the United States. But does it work the other way around? If I'm in the United States, does that entail that I'm in California? No, because there are many other parts of the United States besides California. So everything of California is of the United States, but not everything of the United States is of California. So entailment just means that if the first one's true, the second one has to be. And if it's true that I'm in California, yes, it has to be true that I'm in the United States. But if I'm in the United States, it does not necessarily have to be true that I'm in California. So entailment, um, that's the concept. It was used in, it's used all the time, just in logical deduction. 
um, but it was mentioned by Gettier in the essay he wrote to try and give an idea about how you logically deduce one proposition from another. In the case Gettier gave, Smith believes first that Jones gets the job and Jones has 10 coins in his pocket and he deduces from that the entailed statement that the man who gets the job has 10 coins because if Jones gets it and Jones has 10 and that's true, then it has to logically be true that the man who gets the job has 10 coins. Okay, so um, that kind of relates a little bit to the closure principle, which is the question that comes next. So that's the last one from Gettier's uh, material. The closure principle. This is a little bit of a technical sounding principle. Um, I guess I could write it on the board, but maybe I'll just type it here. I'm gonna type it and then I'll talk to you about it a little bit. So closure principle. But if anybody has any thoughts or ideas about it, please put them out there. Um, that's always helpful. Um, Okay, so I put it there in the live chat um, so you can see that closure principle. It states this. If S, now S is just a letter which stands for a subject, an epistemic agent, like a person, basically, like a person like me or you. So if somebody believes a statement A and then uh, A entails B, sorry, you know what? I got to change one thing. Uh, strike that. Let me redo that. Because I didn't write the word justification, which just my mind slipped for a second. So, second attempt. Okay, if S is justified, A. Sorry for that. Um, what it says now correctly, if S is justified in believing A, so he's got like he or she has reasons to believe it. They have good evidence to believe it. So say a person is justified in believing a statement, and then that statement entails a second one, and then they deduce the second statement from the first. Then they are also justified in believing the second one. So essentially when you deduce something, you're justified in believing that second proposition as long as it, you were already justified in believing the first one that it came from. So right now, um, I don't know, some of you guys might not even be in the state, but suppose that you're still in the state of California, right? Then I would say you would believe that you're in California. And I mean, obviously you're justified in believing that, you know, because you have a lot of evidence just perceiving the environment around you. So let's say you're justified in believing that you're in California right now, okay? And then you just think logically, well, I mean, come on, if I'm in California, then that implies that I'm in the United States. So I deduce that second proposition. All that this closure principle says is that your justification kind of carries over to the second proposition. So since you're already well justified to believe the first thing, since the second thing follows from it, you're also justified in believing that too. Okay, so justification transfers over from one statement to another when you deduce, when you deduce something from one statement to another. That's when you notice that it in, entails that second statement. Okay, guys, good. So um, I'm moving on to now we're talking about Descartes and his topic. So it says, explain Descartes' method of doubt. What is known for certain even when the method's being used and why? All right, good. So that's a simple, I think, clear question. What is the method of doubt? Tell me that, and uh, tell me if you can, uh, what is something that remains certain, right? Isn't that what it says? Yeah, what is something that's still certain, even with the method of doubt being used? So basically, what I'm asking, what's the method of doubt, and what is the thing that it cannot cause you to doubt? 
So method of doubt, let's just say that first. What is the method of doubt? It's something Descartes talked about in the Benetations, um, which is a book he wrote in 1650. No, sorry, 1641. Um, so yes, what's the method of doubt? That's what we'll start with on this question. <clears throat> there's no rush, obviously. I mean, there's plenty of time, um, so nothing but time. <clears throat> with all the bright minds that are here watching, I know we'll get our information. So the method of doubt, <clears throat> what's that? Some of you probably, well, based on how many papers I've gotten, I guess I can't speak too broadly, uh, but some of you might have used this as your topic even. Uh, so Gilberto, it is to assume that everything is false until there are no things to become false. Uh, okay, kind of. I see what you're saying. We cannot doubt that a triangle has three sides, so that is certain, but we can doubt a table because it could be imaginary. Sort of. Um, I like what you're saying. There's mostly truth in that, although I might have to make a couple small corrections. And then, Natalie, you're talking about everything can be doubted. Well, um, no, not everything can be doubted. I mean, most things can be doubted. But he says there is one thing that can't be. So we'll have to speak about what that thing is that can't be doubted. But the method of doubt is uh, to assume, let me, Sherry, here's what you're saying. Question the existence of anything until there is no doubt left that it exists. Mm. So neither Gilberto nor Sherry have really put it the way that I think you need to put it. Uh, Gilberto, you're the closest. You're saying it's to assume that everything is false until there are no things to become false. So it's to assume that something is false if what? You got to say the word if. So let me try and get you to state it again, somebody, by means of including the word if. It says to assume that something is false if what? If what? No, Sherry, you're trying to give information that's relevant to the next question, the one that says, why do we have a method of doubt? I'm not asking you why the method's been created. I'm just asking you what the method tells us to do. And it says, to assume that something is false, if what? Under what condition should I think that something is false, or should I assume anyway that it is? I should assume that something's false if what? When, under what condition should I assume that a thing is false, according to the method of doubt? Assume to be false anything that can possibly be doubted. Okay, well, you didn't want to use the word if, but that's fair. That's another way to put it. You could also say it as such. Assume that something is false if it can possibly be doubted. So if something can be doubted, then assume that it is false, okay? Now, once some uh, method of doubt has been set out there, what are the things that we can doubt? Okay, well, I guess that's coming up in a subsequent question. But this question asks, what's the thing that cannot be doubted? Even with the method of doubt, there's one thing, and actually only one thing, that remains totally dead certain. So what is the one thing that is still certain even when you're using the method of doubt? Assume to be false anything that can possibly be doubted. Okay, so what survives that methodology? You gotta tell me that. <clears throat> that we exist as a mind is certain, right, but why? Why is that certain? That's true, that's correct, but why? Give the reason. It's certain, but why? Just need to know why. Yeah, because you're thinking in the mind. Uh, well, Sherry, I mean, you already said that, though. The mind survives, but the question is, how do you know you, that you exist? Because you have thoughts. Good. Okay, I think, therefore, I am. Right? Like, right now, isn't it weird? Think about that, right? I mean, even if everything you're experiencing right now is a big dream, uh, the one and only thing you can say you can hold on to for sure is you exist. Even if you're living in a weird dream world and everything you've experienced is just a big hologram, if this is a video game or a simulation or you're a dead soul and you're just being reincarnated or you're in some kind of other being's like uh, dimension of reality, no matter what, you know that the fact you're thinking 
shows that you're some kind of conscious mind. So you know you exist even if everything else is fake and false. Um, all right, so let me summarize again. The method of doubt says to assume that things, anything is false if it can be doubted. So assume to be false anything that can possibly be doubted. When this method is being used, almost everything can be doubted, but one thing that can't is that you exist. So one slight um, correction, Natalie, it's not a big thing, but you say because um, that we exist. It's got to be in the singular, that I exist, in the first person, because you don't know that I exist. Maybe I'm just a, a fake hologram giving you a lecture, and you know, you're just a dreamer having a dream that you're causing or something about being the only mind. Okay, so you know you are thinking because you're the one that's thinking those thoughts. But everybody else, all bets are off, at least until later in the meditations when he gets to that. Okay, good. So now we can go into the question that I think, Sherry, you were anticipating. Well, why does he use the method of doubt? What's the point of doing that? Why should we uh, play this game where we say, let's assume that something's false if it can possibly be doubted? What would be the reason to do that? Is it just for laughs? Is it just for fun? What's the reason he said to do that? So why did he create the method of doubt? What was the purpose? <clears throat> Let me know. Method of doubt. Why did it ever get created? What was he thinking? Why did he do that? Right, okay, Gilberto. To be certain of things. Yes. Anyone want to add anything to that? I mean, you could. that's basically true, yes. He's searching for certainty, but kind of a bigger historical, social, cultural context, maybe. That's something that could be mentioned here. Like he said, yes, let's try and discover something that is totally certain that no one could ever doubt. The method of doubt will expose whatever that is. But the reason that he's after that is because... Um, well, your sense perception, Sherry, I think this is funny. You, you wanted to talk about this question. Now you don't want to talk about it. You're going to a different one again. So why did he create the method of doubt? To be certain of things. But why, you know, what's the reason to want to be certain of everything? Well, okay, does this ring a bell? He's living in the 1600s. He's living in the 17th century. This is considered the age of reason. It's when uh, science, math, geometry, anatomy, physics, it's all just exploding with knowledge that never existed before, that was actually suppressed for a long time before uh, the early modern era because the church dominated so much that it wouldn't even let people say, you know, like Galileo, that, uh, that the sun is at the center of our local cosmos. So because of all this new advancing knowledge in the sciences, he says we better make sure to put that on a firm foundation of total certainty and truth. Um, otherwise, we might have to go back later to the foundations and realize they're false, and then everything we built on them is also false. So he says, let's try and make sure we get some certainty to found and base the body of scientific knowledge that's rapidly advancing. So he says the method of doubt is the way to do that, because it will exclude and eliminate all the things that are doubtful, and the only remaining stuff in there will be the stuff that can't be doubted, which, as we just said, starts with the knowledge that you exist because you're thinking. Okay, so good. Next up. Um, now I think, Sherry, yet again, the now uh, next jump ahead is the question here. So perhaps we'll get your response to this. Number 46, explain why beliefs that are derived from sense perception are not certain and why even maybe beliefs about math are not certain according to Descartes. Yeah, so what is the reason that he says you can't trust your senses and who knows if any of it's real? I think this was kind of briefly mentioned in passing a bit ago, but let's just bring it back up. Um, why did Descartes say that all the five senses, sight, taste, touch, hearing, smell, you could just throw them all out the window because you're not really sure if they're correct. What is the reason to doubt those? Those senses, the sense perception, the sense data. What gives a reason to think that that could be false? How could that be false? How could the things that you think that you're seeing not even be real? Because that's something that's capable of being doubted. So why? How could that be doubted?
Yes, it could be wrong, but this is circular. I'm asking the reason why it could be wrong. We've established that it could be, but the question isn't just that it could be. Why? Okay, good, Gilberto, because we could be dreaming. Yes. Uh, in fact, if we were dreaming, if you were dreaming, then you wouldn't even really be attending a lecture. Maybe you're not even a student. You know, Maybe um, you're not even a human being. Like Maybe you don't even have this body that you think you have. It could have been that you've been dreaming throughout your whole life. Um, so you can't tell the difference between when you're awake and when you're asleep. Therefore, maybe you're asleep right now, and uh, this isn't even really happening. So because perceptions are formed in a way that could be also uh, formed in dreams, it's not possible, he thinks, to, to say for sure that your waking experiences are not dreams. So you could doubt that. And then the other part is math. How could you doubt math? Now, earlier, Gilberto, you said that you could not doubt that there's three sides to a triangle. But actually, no. Descartes says you could even doubt that. You could even doubt the things that seem totally clear from math and from geometry and logic. Uh, because there could be an evil demon who's manipulating you about those things. Now, he says, at first, God has all the power that you could possibly imagine. So if God wanted to, he could you know, mess with your thoughts and ideas about math. Um, but he would not do it, even though he could because he's too good to do that. He's perfectly good, and that's that's messed up, you know, to, to trick you about even math. So he says, well, never mind that, but if there were an evil demon that had power over you, that's not a being that has to be perfectly good, so maybe there could be something along those lines. So whether it's because of the possibility of dreams or because of the possible existence of some external deceiver like an evil demon, um, we can't say that we know any of this stuff from even math or from the five senses. Okay, good. Dreams, evil demon. You have to give the elaborate story, though, to explain that. Okay, so one more about Descartes, and that's about the wax. Okay, so Descartes gave this example of like a blue piece of beeswax. Um, what he really said was that suppose the wax has features that you could uh, perceive with your five senses, one for each of the five senses. So like for vision, it looks blue. For... Um, taste, it tastes like honey. For smell, it smells like a flower. For touch, it feels cold and it's hard. And for um, sound, it'll make like a, a noise if you struck it with your knuckle or whatever. But he says, imagine that you expose that one piece of wax to a very powerful flame. Now the wax melts and it completely changes. So if you look at it at the second later time after the heat, it's not blue, it doesn't taste like honey anymore, it doesn't smell like flowers anymore. It's not car cold. It's not hard. And it won't make that same noise of like a knocking knuckle. If anything, you splash right through it because it's now liquefied. So the wax has changed a lot, and it's lost all of the initial perceptual qualities that it had. So what he's trying to say is that those perceived qualities that you get through the five senses, they're not really essential to the wax because those qualities could come and go but the wax will still exist. So when you want to think about the essential features of the wax, you have to think about the things that have not changed from the time where it was a normal piece of wax till after it was melted. And the things that have not changed is that it's something which is still extended, meaning that it takes up space. It's still something that is flexible, meaning that it can be shaped into different forms. And it's still something that is changeable, meaning that it can just um, acquire different properties or attributes. So he says flexible, changeable, extended. Those are the really deeper essential properties of a piece of wax or of any physical object. So it's again his attempt to kind of point out that what you see or perceive with your five senses is like less essential than the things that you can understand with your mind and with your intellect. Um, because when you think about extension and changeability and flexibility, you're not thinking in terms of the five senses, but rather the conceptual understanding of what the object is like across all of its possible changes. Okay, so the five senses only give you non-essential attributes of wax or of other objects, but thinking about them in the deeper way through the intellect reveals to you what their essential attributes are. And that's extension, flexibility, and changeability. Okay, so then, we go on to Einstein, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the time material. So Einstein's example of the moving train. Tell me at least some basic stuff about that whole example. 
the example that he gave says, um, suppose that there were two, what are the events that he's talking about concerning this um, railway embankment? He asks us to think about what scene or situation. So going to Einstein now. The situation given by Einstein that he wants us to consider. What is it? So the question puts it as, uh, explain Einstein's example of the moving train. So there is a moving train involved, but we'll get to that. The first thing is lightning strikes, right? So there's two lightning strikes. They occur on two places along a railway track, yeah? And the claim was that they were simultaneous. Good, Sherry. So two lightning strikes happen simultaneously, but here's his question. What does that actually mean? What's the precise definition of simultaneous? So he says, okay, here's the best way to define that. How does he say we should define the simultaneity here? He says, take the distance between the two events. Um, so here, I'll draw you a little picture. So we see here that these, these two lightning strikes that are occurring on this railway, we say they're simultaneous, but how do we really know? Well, he says, do this. Get the midpoint, M, place an observer there at that midpoint. This is the point that's in between A and B, exactly halfway. So the distance from A to this M is the same as the distance of B to M. Now suppose that the observer can see both of those positions at, at once in one field of vision. And then also, suppose that the speed of light is fixed, meaning that it's always the same velocity. So if that's all the case, then if he sees A and B at the same time from this position standing still, we would call the two events simultaneous relative to him. Why? Because the two light beams from A and from B, they travel the same distance to get to point M. And they arrive at that destination at the same time and they're traveling at the same velocity over the same distance, arriving at the same uh, final destination at the same time, which means they left from A and B at the same time too. So that's how it seems that to be simultaneous according to his position. But if we have a second observer, okay, so the second observer has to be mentioned. The second observer, let's say, is on this train, which is going in this direction with velocity V, away from A and over towards B. Now he's going to surpass the midpoint as he travels along the railway. When he surpasses M prime and he breaks that plane, let's say that at that exact moment this guy is doing his observation and he sees the two lightning strikes happening simultaneously. But because he is actually being carried to the right with velocity V, he's going to see the event B happening before A because the distance between him and the beam of light from B is shorter than the distance between him and the beam of light from A, because he's going to be running past the midpoint and closing the gap between himself and B and opening a bigger one between himself and A. So thus, the same two events, two lightning strikes, they seem to be simultaneous to this person, and they seem to be out of sync in this guy's experience, B happening first because he's traveling closer to it, and so the light beam from A has further to catch up to reach his eyes. What that means then is that the concept of two events happening simultaneously cannot be stated objectively as an objective fact. It's just relative to the observer, which gets really weird and deep and trippy because if there's no objective fact about the order of events in time, then time's not linear. And um, one person's past is another person's future is another person's present, just depending on their relative position in space and their state of motion regarding the observed events. Okay, so this is the Einstein example. Basically, two lightning strikes from this guy's position are simultaneous, but the one on the train, they're not. Because as he passes the midpoint, he's closer to B than A. But this person is standing still at an equal distance from A and B when the two light beams reach him. Okay? So good. Then that's the Einstein first question. Next up, um, why is the concept of time moving a paradox? So this takes us into the Ted Sider um, article, Theodore Sider, Time. Help me out with that a little bit. To say that the concept of time moving is a paradox, how does that work? How is it a paradox? Um, I'll just wait and see what you have. 
So, so people always say that time is moving, right? That's like a common way of talking. Um, time is flying. Time is rushing past me. I feel like time stood still. Or wait, did it slow down? Um, time waits for no man. Time marches on. So there's all kinds of phrases which indicate that we think of time as moving. But why is that something that's actually kind of like a paradox to explain, something that's incoherent to give an account of? Why is it that same time moves, it kind of runs into circles? Okay, Michael, when movement is talked about, we already refer to time, exactly. So if we say the time moves, that is like saying it is in different places at different times, and that does not make a lot of sense. That leads us to an infinite regress. Okay, perfect, exactly, yeah. So <clears throat> to say that anything moves through space is to say that it's at different places at different times. So like if my, um, if my hand passes from this point in space to this point over here, it had to be at all these places in between, at all the different time points in between when I first moved it and when I set it down there. So anything that's moving in space has to be at different places at different times. If this pen right here stays here for all of the rest of time, then it's not going to move. In order for it to move, it's going to have to be in a different place at another time. Okay? So if time moves, then by similar uh, analysis, that would mean that time is at different places at different times. But that takes us just in the direction of a circle. We're using the word time in the definition of the concept itself. And yes, that does lead to an infinite regress, which seems to be absurd. Some try to say that time moves by claiming that the present moment is moving. Like, for example, right now the present moment is 6.51, um, but in an hour the present moment will be 7.51, and then an hour after that the present moment will be 8.51. So is it because the present moment keeps shifting around that we say time moves? Again, what uh, Cider believes is that this is really no better because it's like saying that at one time, at an earlier time, 6.51 was present. At a second later time, 751 was present. At a subsequent, even later third time, 851 was present. But we're using the word time again to talk about the different temporal positions of the present. So it just leads us towards a circular description, which takes no, um, you know, which, which is absurd. Uh, so anyway, he says, let's instead just say time doesn't actually move at all. It's just sitting there like space. Space has no direction. It just contains everything. So the same with time. Time and space are one structure, and they don't move. They just hold all the events. Okay. So next up, two similarities between time and space, according to Ted Sider. Uh, <clears throat> there's three similarities between time and space that he mentions, but the question asks for two. Nevertheless, just so we're totally fully um, clear, I think let's go and talk about all three. So what are the three similarities? You don't maybe have to say every word about them, but if you could just sort of point me towards the, the general description of them. Three similarities between time and space, according to Cider. Okay, first, Michael, in terms of reality, and you're saying we're objects that are far away in space, they're just as real as objects that are present in space, and that's the same uh, with time. Good, perfect. Uh, so in terms of reality, that's one of the similarities. What's another one? In terms of reality, it's also in terms of something else. Well, what's the something else? Parts, reality, here and now. Okay, Sherry, very good, very simple. Uh, yes, in terms of reality was the first mention, then parts, then in terms of the words here and now. So let me just break down each one. Michael, you kind of helped with the first a little bit, but I'll just add a few points. So space and time, he says, are similar on the one hand in terms of reality. What that just means is no matter how far away an object is in space, it's still just as real as when it's close to you in space, right? So like objects don't cease to exist just because they're further away from you or closer to you. So like, you know, the device that you're watching this on, it, it exists and it's right in front of you. But even if you threw it a million miles away, it would still exist. It would just be farther from you, okay? Now the same he's saying is true of time. Moments that are not the present moment, but far away from it, they're just as real as the present. So, of course, this present moment is real because here you're experiencing it. But you, in like 10 years, 
uh, that moment also is real. And you back as a baby in the past, that moment's real too. All of them are real. It's not that the present moment's the only thing. Okay, so distance in space and in time doesn't change how real something is. The second was in terms of parts. So for that, we have to talk about the concept of temporal parts. Um, now, maybe I should have done the ordering of the numbers a little different because I know I asked a question about temporal parts um, after that. But we'll just kind of cover it now. What is a temporal part? Just let me know. What is a temporal part of something? Help me with that, and then I can uh, help you with a little bit more information from there. Temporal part? What is it? A lot of words, right, in philosophy, but the thing is not just to have the words, but the definitions in your mind, right? So what's a temporal part? <clears throat> I'm just going to hold for it. I know you got it. I know it's right there, so I'm just waiting for a minute. <clears throat> Temporal part. Okay, so Sherry, you're saying you in the smallest measure of time, a slice of you in time. That's a fair way to put it. Michael, you say a temporal part is just an object at a single moment of time. Yes. For example, when a photograph is taken of myself, only one temporal part of myself is in it. Perfect, yeah. You know, I uh, this is little tangent maybe, but I just saw something um, published in the news that they just created this like world's most advanced camera that the shutter speed is like almost down to like the plank length of time. It's like 700 million uh, frames or something per second. You know, when I talk to you guys about the example of take a photo of a person and you see um, one of their temporal parts, yes, um, but some might argue that if the frame rate of the camera, you know, uh, if it was like video is, is too slow, then even one frame contains like a blur of motion. Um, but anyway, back to what we were talking about. Yeah, so a single moment in an individual's existence is a temporal part of them. Uh, and the claim is that you're sort of um, composed by spatial parts, which are just physical body parts and parts in space but also temporal parts, which are time parts. That's why you occupy time. Physical parts, spatial parts are why you occupy space. So like, why is my arm applying pressure to the table? Because it's a body part of my body. And that's why it sits on the table and takes up that little space on it. But why does my life take up, you know, years? Because I've got temporal parts that extend throughout the whole time span. Um, okay, and they're just equally as real. The temporal parts of you all throughout your whole timeline, they're all just as real as the body parts that you, that you have attached to you right now. Okay, and the third one was in terms of the words here and now. Can you say anything about how they're similar, those two words? What's the similarity between those two words, here and now? Now, here is like a spatial word because it refers to space and a position in space. Now is a temporal word because it refers to time and a position in time. So what's the similarity between these two position words, here and now? Okay, good, Michael. Both are relative terms, and their meaning is contingent on the context of the speaker. Yeah, so the word here, where is it? Where is the word here referring to? It depends on who the speaker is. Sorry, well, really where the speaker is when they say it. If I say to you that um, my cat is here, like, that's true, because she is, like, right over here. But... If you say Professor Vulich's cat is here, where you're at, that's a false statement because my cat's not over there, she's here. Which statement is true, that she's here or that she's not here? Well, there are two different here's, aren't there? My word here refers to my uh, you know, house and your word here refers to your local uh, position in space. So there's no objective place called here, it's just wherever a speaker is speaking. Just like the word now, when is now? Well, there's no specific moment in time that is now. There's no objective point in time that is now. It's relative. So now is just whenever a speaker speaks the term. If I say now we're learning this, uh, you know, review sheet, now is referring to 6.50, almost 6.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, May 14, 2020. But people speaking in a year from this moment will be referring to the same date and time in 2021. So which one is now? 
they're both now because they're both spoken by different uh, temporal parts of a person at different points in uh, space time. Okay, and so let me make sure I got everyone's comments. Sherry, both are relative terms, depend on the context of the speaker. Here's where the speaker is, now is when the speaker speaks. Yes, very good. Okay, so we're all clear on that. Thank you guys. I know, you know, Sherry and Michael, you guys are doing a real heavy lift. You're doing a big solid for everybody else. I hope you enjoy that. If you don't, I'm very sorry about it. But to the other students, you know, um, concerns of equity would be great. You know, if someone wanted to just chip, chip in, even if you feel like uh, you're not as capable as you want to be, anything's great because, um, you know, it helps you. It helps support the class. And uh, in the end, it's just fun. I don't know. It's just fun, right? Just talking, isn't it? It's, it's called the love of wisdom. It's not called the like painful, very depressing, hard, uh, miserable uh, pursuit of wisdom. It's it's love, so it's passion. All right, so thanks again, everyone, and we'll keep, keep going from there. Um, what's next? So the next one is explain why, according to the space-time theory, nothing actually changes. Yeah. Why would one say that if the space-time theory is correct, then there's no real such thing as change? And I, I do appreciate it, Michael um, and all the others. I mean, I understand that there's there's reasons to be shy with all the heady material that we're talking about, but you know, you still got to try and challenge yourself, don't you? You still have to try and reach for that higher level of understanding when things are tough. So I'm just trying to tease it out of you a little bit, as I must as a professor. So anyway, back to what I'm asking. Yeah. Um, Nothing changes in the space-time theory. What is that? Why? Why Why would one say that according to the theory, nothing changes? Let's see what you can say. <clears throat> nothing changes according to the thought of space-time theory. Why not? I mean, like say a person grows a beard. They didn't have it before. That's kind of like my situation in a way. Um, did I change? Well, it seems like it, but the space-time theory would say actually no. Well, why would they say that it's not actually, doesn't count technically as that change? It takes a moment to say it. Because the past, present, and future are all real. Okay, good. So the point in space-time where the individual has got a clean shaven face and a subsequent point later in space-time where they have got facial hair, they've both always just existed on that same timeline of the person's whole space-time um, diagram. So there's not actually any change. The temporal parts themselves possess those features and they've always just existed. So what we call change would simply be reconsidered and thought of as different attributes of different temporal parts of the same object. So like if I lost a finger right now, which that would be painful, but if I did, then one would ordinarily, everyday speech, say, oh, well, you've changed because you had 10 fingers and now you have nine. But in the space-time theory, we would just say, well, look, there are two adjacent temporal parts of this being. <laughs> the previous one had the 10 fingers. The subsequent one had the nine. But they've both been adjacent temporal parts the entire you know, manifold of space-time throughout. So not so much change as just different features along different points in the space-time diagram. Okay, like an analogy for that, which just so that we can get one analogy to that. If you're driving down the road and say the roadway, it starts off as a very smooth, very nicely paved road, but then you get into bumpy terrain where there's a lot of pop, potholes and um, cracks in the, in the pavement, right? So as you start hitting all those bumps, you might say, man, the road has really changed, you know? But actually, uh, let's say that this road has always had that one bumpy section and the one smooth section from the very first day one of the existence of the road. So has the road changed? No, it's just that one part of it doesn't have the bumps and a later part does. And so like you're kind of like the road itself by analogy in a space-time diagram. The earlier points in the road are like the earlier stages in your time sequence. And the later stages, they have different features. So like there's temporal parts of you that are like old uh, I would hope if you make it and have a nice full long life like I'm hoping and then you have temporal parts of you back here That are like little baby temporal parts and then sandwiched in between there's the stuff that's happening to you right now But all of them have all been there the whole time. and They always will be so no real change. Okay, so then we keep going um, Soon he will be in the past 
David Lewis talked about this uh, weird sounding sentence. It sounds like it's an oxymoronic statement, like a contradiction. Because if soon I will be in the past, what are we saying? Like soon in the future, I'm going to be behind in time? That sort of sounds like time going in opposite directions. But David Lewis says, no, I can explain that and make sense of it. So he says to really sort of make sense of a statement like soon he will be in the past. We have to come up with uh, two different time frames, two different ways of measuring time. All right. So like what, what are those two different ways of measuring or um, experiencing time? He calls one blank time and then the other one blank time. So there's like a prefix that comes before the word time. And he divides time into these two sorts, these two kinds, these two types. So what are the two types of time? Okay, personal and external. That's right, Michael. So what are the two? Personal time is like the time as the individual experiences it who's doing the time traveling. It's like the time that is shown on their wrist watch, which will be attached to their body. External time is time that would be experienced or measured by all external observers and clocks other than the one time traveler. So if somebody, let's say, got in a time machine to go back in time or whatever, and they said, this is crazy, in 15 minutes, I'm gonna be watching the LA riots live in 1991. It sounds like they're saying basically like in 15 minutes, I'm gonna be 30 years or so in the past, which, or is it 92? Anyway, LA riots. Um, is, is it a contradiction? Well, no, because now what we're really saying, according to the different time frames, is that in 15 minutes of personal time, like that's how long it'll take me to have the time machine process me and spit me out, I will be minus 28 years, whatever, in external time. And according to Einstein's um, relativity, we actually do each occupy our own personal time frame. It's just that they generally coincide because uh, we don't have the means to achieve velocities that are so much different than other people that we start to see time dilating for some and not for others. So personal and external time is how you can make sense of a statement like that. Soon he will be in the past means soon in personal time. He'll be in the past and external time. Okay. So we go on from there. Um... What's the next one? I keep losing my place. Ah, okay, yeah, so describe a possible closed loop of causation involving time travel. David Lewis gave an example of such a loop. You don't have to use his, but that I guess would be um, available for you to use. This is just asking you to give a situation, a scenario from like a science fictional time travel kind of plot. And you have to give a situation where um, the cause and the effect of something are kind of like the same and it's going in a circle. Like one example could be, does anyone remember this? Michael or Sherry probably, but if anyone can tell me a possible kind of plot narrative that we discussed in this class on this subject. <clears throat> it's, like a, it's like a weird time travel type scenario. But the whole point of it is to show that if time travel were real or if it actually did happen, it could introduce these weird loops. Sherry, you said you watched Time Crimes, though. So, I mean, you would have definitely seen the loop in that movie um, if you did watch it, like you said. But anyway, okay, so uh, not the grandfather paradox, even though, I mean, I could imagine something like that. Like, okay, like here, let me see. This is going to be a weird one. I'm just making this up on, off the top of my head. But this is crazy, right? So, like, a person... Um, Man, if I can even do this. Okay, so like a – no, I can't. I was trying to think of like someone who gives birth to themselves because they, they go back in time. They conceive the child that ends up becoming them. And then when that child gets older, they go back in time to cause the conception yet again. Maybe that could work, right? I don't know if I'm, I'm – I might – I don't want to like freestyle or ad lib too much while we're doing this because I, I just – you know, I could go back to the textbook. But I'm thinking that could be one, right? So like – they just pop out of the womb, they're born, okay. They grow up, they grow up, they grow up, and their whole life they're like, who's my father? And the mother's like, don't ask that question, don't worry about it, uh, your father's gone, right? But he wants to know who the father was. So later on in his life, um, 
Well, that'd be kind of messed up though, because then he'd have to like, have sex with his mom or something in the past. That'd be like incest. But anyway, yeah. So we talked about time traveling and calling yourself. So yeah, here's another one, maybe better. I don't want to get into all that other stuff. But Terminator's kind of like that a little bit. Um, the guy, John Connor, that goes back, or that he's like the, the child conceived by Sarah Connor. Um, the conception is caused by the person who goes back trying to protect Sarah Connor. But let's stick with the one from the book. That's better. Okay, so someone calls you on the phone, and they're like, build a machine. So you say, sure, I'll do it. You don't know who they are, even though their voice sounds randomly familiar to you, but you just do it. So you do build the machine based on the instructions. Now, um, later on in life, you want to use that machine because it's a time machine. So you take a trip back to the time period where you first received the phone call. And when you do that, you go back and you say, well, I'm going to call myself and tell them how to build that machine. So you place the phone call to your younger self, and then they go to work and they create it, just like you did when you were the younger stage in the temporal sequence. That would be a loop, because if we ask where did the information come from to build the machine, it seems like it literally just comes out of nowhere. Like, well, you knew it because someone called you on the phone, but that person was actually you in the future. And then you were able to tell your younger self because you remembered hearing the information when you were the younger person. But where did the information come from in the first place? It seems kind of like just mind-boggling and circular. But for some reason, David Lewis doesn't find that to be a paradox. Um, yeah, so that's a weird case. But anyway, that's what that one's talking about. If you can come up with a different one, you could feel free to use that too. Sherry, the time crime situation, if you want to use that as a narrative, that would be a fair example too. Okay. So then, um, if a person talks to their past self on the phone, how many people are having the conversation? And, and explain why you give me that number. Okay, so we just talked about a kind of case like that. Person's talking to themselves um, on the phone when they were younger. Like, I don't know, to make it I, it's kind of impossible to be relatable, but suppose that a time machine came out tomorrow and you got in it and you went back to 2016 to tell yourself in 2016, heads up, there's going to be some type of crazy pandemic four years from now. Who, how many people are involved in that conversation there? 2020 you going back to talk to 2016, slightly younger you. How many people is that? And, you know, just give me a little discussion on that. How many people is that? The phone call that's going on. The future self and the past self. It's one person on the phone. So what are the two things then? If it's one person, clearly there's two different in sort of things involved in the conversation. Yes, one because it's just you, and that's good, but I wanna just make sure we put our finger on this little added point. It is one person, but yet we could say it's two uh, of something. Two what things? <clears throat> Two, yeah, two temporal parts of the same person. So um, why is that the best description? Well, because when it's actually two different separate people, there's no psychological continuity between two separate people. So when I like met you guys on day one of the class, that's the first time I ever heard of you and ever saw you, right? Um, but I have memories of myself uh, when I was a younger person or when I was a teenager or when I was you know, in my 20s and stuff. So if I made a phone call like to my younger version of myself after I traveled to the past, I would have the memory of being the younger individual. And also there's like um, physical continuity between us too. Because like for example, I don't know, I have like a small scar here on my forehead and um, you know, I've had that throughout my life because it actually happened when I was very, very young, like toddler age. Um, so the another reason to think that that's actually me, the younger person that I'm talking to on the phone, is that I bear the same scar that the younger individual had. And two different people don't have physical continuity nor psychological continuity. So um, that would be a case of two temporal parts of the same person interacting. Okay, cool. So people having temporal parts, I think we've covered that. A temporal part of an object is just an object at a single moment of time. Like, for example, what could be shown in a single uh, still image of that person. Okay. Grandfather paradox. This is the last one on time. So David Lewis gave this additional example to try and, you know, explore some of the weird uh, 
puzzling paradoxical elements of time travel. So grandfather paradox. Once again, it's kind of like a, almost like a science fiction novel or something. What's the basic plot of that one? You know, fans of cinema and literature, you can simply give me, I think, a basic description of that. Um, what is it? I'm plugging this into my computer. Yeah, time is a really interesting, weird topic. I think about it a lot. <clears throat> but yes, grandfather paradox. What is that? <clears throat> the there's some details there, but I think we can get the basics out. Hold on, I think my cat I'll get her really fast. Okay, so yeah, person wants to go back in time and kill their grandfather. Um, that's Tim. Tim has a, a real strong motive to kill his own grandfather, but the thing is his grandfather is actually already dead. So what he really wants to do is go back and kill his grandfather while he was still alive and in his prime. But, okay, to do that, he would have to kill him before he ever um, fathered the parent of Tim. And therefore, he would, like, annul his own birth if he actually carried out this mission successfully. So the question of Lewis is, what do you think? Is it possible for him to kill his grandfather or not? Can he do it or can he not do it? At first, he says both answers, yes and no, seem initially plausible. On the hand of yes, you know, he made a trip to the past and he seems to have a rifle and he's, you know, um, definitely going to try and make an attempt. So that makes it seem like why not? But on the other hand, when you look at a bigger picture, I hope you can understand why it seems like impossible because how would that make sense? If he kills his grandfather, then he was never born. But if he was never born, then he couldn't have killed the grandfather. And we know that he was, in fact, born. So, like, world history and space-time cannot contradict itself. It cannot contain the birth and then also not. So, um, in the end, Lewis says the only coherent explanation would be that he can't succeed. doesn't mean that he can't attempt and fail, but he won't be able to actually uh, succeed because we know how the story ends in terms of him being born later on in the future and also the fact that the grandfather didn't die of this cause. Um, one last point there is that he says, the word can itself is sometimes ambiguous. Sometimes we use it in a narrow sense and sometimes we use it in a broad sense. The narrow sense of the word refers to what a person can do given just a very limited range of factors about them. The broad sense of the word refers to what a person can do concerning a much more extensive range of facts about them. So when we say that he can, in the narrow sense, sure, because he's there, right? We just look at that, it seems like he can. But in the broad picture sense, we would say no, he can't, because in the big picture of you know, time, this guy ends up being born, so there's nothing that can change that. Um, and I find that very interesting myself to think about it outside the context of time travel, because if the space-time theory is true and... After all, it is the consensus view of like modern physicists. If it's really true, then you yourself cannot do anything other than what you are actually doing or what you will do uh, because the timeline is just baked into space-time overall. And so you really only have the illusion of being able to do counterfactual behavior. So like since you're watching this lecture right now, you're predestined to watch it. Um, it was always going to happen. and It was always part of the overall playing out of events in the sequence that uh, constitutes all the moments of your life. Okay, so, and let me make sure I get these comments from you, Michael. Per problem that would arise if a person were to travel to a past time, the name comes from the idea that if a person travels to a time before her, their grandfather had children and kills them, it would make their own birth impossible. Very good, yes. Okay, so now we're going on to the philosophy of mind, and uh, you know, that is our last topic. So we have a lot of questions on it, but we're getting close to the end now. So monism and dualism. Um, what are those two perspectives or views? 
Hint, they have to do with how many substances make up everything in this world. But what are the two different views? Monism says what? And then dualism says what? What are those different concepts? <clears throat> Monism and dualism. So that's just the question for now. Monism and dualism. Two words, two definitions, one general interest, which is how many things make this world up. Okay, so Michael, monism says everything in this universe is only made out of one kind of substance, correct? Yes, exactly. So from the monist perspective, everything around you, everything out there in the whole big universe, from the biggest to the smallest stuff, and you too, it's all just made out of one kind of substance, one. Now, Gilberto, what you say is there's one substance. Uh, now, let me be a little bit more careful, though, about that, Gilberto, because it, monism says there's only one substance, but there's actually two kinds of monism, depending on which one substance is the one and only one. Dualism, as you say correctly, is that there are two substances. The universe is made out of two. Now, briefly, let us discuss what the two substances could be. Michael, dualism is everything in the universe is made out of two kinds of substance. All right. Now, to fully, completely answer this question, we just have to speak for a moment about what those substances are claimed to be. So one possible substance, uh, Gilberto, you referred to physical matter. Who could tell me just the basic definition of physical matter? What is it? Physical matter is what kind of thing? And then, or, and then we can also talk about mind. So for any of you here, you know, see if you can get to it. Mike was saying, Adam, anything that is extended in space. Yeah, so that's kind of like a, those both are in play. Physical matter is anything that is extended in space, meaning that it just takes up some of the space. It's, it's there in space and it takes up some of it. Atoms are basically considered to be the most uh, minimal part of extended space. So extended matter. So good. Anything extended in space and at the ultimate level, atoms. Mind, yes, good, Michael, is considered to be something that has no extension in space and is thinking. So it, it's more like a spirit or a soul, something that you couldn't weigh, measure, or look at with a microscope even. It's just literally got no extension in space. But it's, con it's pure consciousness, not mixed together with physical matter at all. Now, what are the two types of monism? What are the two types of monism? And just tell me what the definitions are of both. And then we will, we, that'll be everything that you could possibly say about monism and dualism. You tell me what they both mean. You talk about what both of the substances are. <clears throat> and then you distinguish the two possible varieties of monism. So one of the two kinds is called, I'll just wait for it. <clears throat> Gilberto, so you're talking about idealism. Sherry, you just gave the names, idealism and physicalism. So good, Gilberto, here's the information. Idealism says everything's made up of ideas and thoughts, so there's no matter. And um, physicalism, everything is made up of matter, including, including, and this is important, physicalism says everything's made out of physical matter, including consciousness and thought. So even you know, your thoughts and feelings and emotions, your hopes, dreams, fears, uh, whatever other thoughts that you have in your head, that's all just brain processes playing out. So that's a physical process of the brain. Cool. So one last summary statement. Monism says everything's made out of one substance, everything in the universe. Dualism says the universe is built out of two kinds of substance. Dualists embrace both substances, physical matter and mind. They say they're both there. But for the monists, depending on which one they think is the only one, there's two different ways they can go. They could be physicalist monists who say if it's all made out of matter, even your thoughts are. Or they could be idealist monists, which to be honest is not the most prevalent anymore, but that holds that everything around you is just thoughts and there's really no such thing as physical matter at all. 
Okay, good. So that would that would be some info for that one. Next, we got fifty eight. Uh, so I guess I kind of you know covering more than one at a time. Fifty eight just says difference between physicalism and idealism, and I think now um, we we talk about that. Okay, so Descartes' argument that the mind and the body are are different things. Now that's a complex argument. Uh, um, maybe you can give a more detailed answer if I chose this for the final, but for now anyway, for our review, just hit me with the big points here in this argument. Like, what's the overall major claims that leads Descartes to say that the mind and the body are just different things? They're not the same thing. And they could even be separate from each other. Um, that they are separate from each other. How does Descartes get to that conclusion? Um, any of the any of the principles or statements that lead him to that conclusion would be useful for me to just kind of pick up from. So we're asking about Descartes' argument for dualism, his argument that the mind and the body are just different things, two different substances, that they, that they exist separately, even though they're somehow interacting right now for a little while. Why does he say the mind and the body are not the same? See if you can, you know, Take a little bit uh, from your notes or from your memory, or from the book, from any of those, and uh, just put something on the table for me here. Okay, because you can clearly conceive them uh, as what? I think your sense is almost complete, but there's a little, I think, few words missing out. Gilberto, mind is an influence from God, whereas the body has no relation to the mind. It is possibly just an imaginary portion of my mind. Yes, good. That's definitely relevant to the correct information to answer this. Um, so I like what I'm hearing from both of you. Anybody else? Michael or, I don't know, Natalie or somebody out there? Uh, yeah, so he can clearly conceive of them being separate. Michael, using the method of doubt, I could doubt everything I perceive by the senses, even math and logic, right? So all of the stuff you guys are saying is correct, but it's, it's a little out of the logical order that we need. So, uh, But that's, of course, fair because you're just trying to contribute one little piece. Let me just bring these points together then. So it does start off with him saying that using that method of doubt that we talked about earlier, there's a whole bunch of things that you can doubt. Maybe reality around you isn't even real. Um, but no matter what, you know you exist uh, because you're thinking. Even if the thing that you are isn't even a physical object like a physical body, you know you're a mind at a minimum because you are thinking. Okay, and then he says after that, well, what's the ideas that you're thinking of? One of them is the idea of God. And that is a really unique idea because it's the idea of a perfect, infinite being. So since you have the idea of an infinite being, there has to be something that causes the idea, which is at least itself infinite, because otherwise it would never be able to give you the idea. So remember our steps. Everything can be doubted except that you exist. You know you've got a mind. You have the idea of God, and that has to come from something, so there really has to be a God. From there, he gets into the point that God would never deceive you because he's perfectly good. Since God's not a deceiver and he's perfectly good, that means that if you have a clear and distinct perception, it has to actually be true because God wouldn't want to mess with you, giving you clear and distinct perceptions, and then just kind of laughing that you think they're true, but they're really not. That wouldn't be good, and God is good. So when you have clear and distinct perceptions, they have to be true. That's guaranteed and backed by the perfection of God. Now, after that, there's just a few more steps. One of the things that is clear is that if you can imagine two things existing separately, then they really can exist separately. And finally, I can imagine my mind and a body existing separately because uh, the existence of the body can be doubted, but the existence of the mind cannot. Therefore, since I can imagine my mind existing separately from the body, they really have to be two different things. And therefore, the mind and the body are two different things. So the basic major claims along the way are that you know God exists because you know you exist and you have an idea of him. And you know God's perfect and he's not a trickster to deceive you. So clear perception's got to be true. Something that's clear is that when th two things can be divided out in your thought process, then they can actually be divided out in reality, like me and these glasses. I could take them off and that's obviously possible. And since you can clearly imagine me and the glasses being separated, we're not the same and we are two different things. So you can imagine the mind and the body being separated, like your soul escaping the body or no longer inhabiting it. 
And since that's possible, then they really are two different things. It's about conceivability. Since I can clearly conceive them to be separate, like we started with Sherry, and because God guarantees that clear things are true, that must be true. Okay, so that's his big dualist argument. Then, how does he get to the claim that the external world exists? Okay, so he also says that's clear and distinct, that the external world outside of you, like that you're looking around and seeing, it is not a dream, actually. Now, towards the end of his book, he's comfortable saying it's clear that it's not a dream. But he gave some reasons for that, and we just want to mention what those were. So who could say at least one or two reasons that, like, it's very obvious that the external world exists. Um, so, yeah, what makes that seem pretty, pretty obvious? <clears throat> and you can't just say, because I'm seeing it. Uh, because you got to be a little bit more nuanced than that. So um, why is it clear and obvious that the external world is not a dream? Like, what is it about the experience that you have of it that, that seems to show that it's actually externally real outside of your head? Okay, so this is because we don't have control over the world, and we cannot make ourselves, you're saying, more powerful. Another reason is that I cannot feel what the other person is feeling when they touch a ball. Okay, Gilberto, good. Um, the only thing about the second point there, that you can't feel what another person is feeling, that has to do with the next question, actually. So if you look at the list, the next question after this is, um, why is it so clear and distinct that you have a body? So that you have a body is related to that other point. So we'll get to that in a moment. But the first part of your answer is correct. Uh, it seems like the external world exists because you can't just perceive whatever you want, right? So if I, like look at this table and I'm like, let me just, I don't know, um, like by really, really thinking hard, I'm just going to manifest, uh, I don't know, a teddy bear right here. And it's just going to appear on this table. But like, I can't do that. Like, I can think of one in my head, but I can't uh, see one as though it's outside of my head in the actual space. So reality, therefore, doesn't seem to be something that you can just mentally shape. Um, that means that it's actually real out there and it's not just something that you're creating. So one thing is that you can't control what you perceive. Another is that you cannot only perceive the things that are happy or favorable. Um, Natalie, that's another good one. Life is continuous and dreams are episodic. Yeah, he also does mention that. Um, so like today we're having a, a final review session and last week we were having a lecture and those two uh, events connect. But a dream that you have tonight is not gonna really have anything to do with the dream that you had like a week ago. So the continuity of the waking experiences is another reason to think that there's an external world. And there was this one more, which is that memories, like think back to a memory right now, it's not as sharp and vivid and clear as what happens in the present. And that only really makes sense if there's an external environment around you. Because why is it less vivid later? That's because you're no longer in the presence of the objects which gave you the original experience. So um, try to remember Orange Coast College, it's not as clear in your head as it is when you're in the building. And um, that's because when you're in the building, you're in the environment with the objects that you're looking at. Now, when you think about it in your mind's eye, without the aid of photographs or videos, uh, you have to recreate it as though you originally perceived it. But it's not as sharp. Now, if there was no external reality, then kind of remembering something would be the same as perceiving it in the first place, because in both cases, there wouldn't be an external environment around you. Okay, so that's all the information for why the external world evidently does exist. And now we can uh, go on to the next a question. And maybe, Gilberto, your comment now can come into play. The next one is, so how does he establish that, that you have a body? So saying that you have a body, how is that something that he believes can be um, reasonably judged? Why is that clear and distinct, that, that you have a body? So one of them, Gilberto, you kind of already talked about. That is that um, you cannot experience other people's sensations, only your own. So if somebody else is out there in the cold and I'm in my apartment with the heater on, I don't feel the, the chilliness that they're experiencing um, because that's not my body that, that they're being uh, affected by, right? So I only feel the effects and the stimuli given to this body, not to others. And then um, other reasons, if you could come up with another one or two. Yeah, the other thing is you cannot remove yourself from your own body, like you can't 
um, separate yourself from it, even though he says that the mind and the body can be imagined to be separate. That's something that happens at death, not like uh, in, in your current life, that you're still existing in the body within. Um, but every other object out there in space, you can and you often do create a gap between yourself and it. You know, like when you park your car, you go away from the car. Um, when you go to college, sometimes you move away from your parents. Um, so you can go away from other things, but not the body there that's attached to you or that is, is you, depending on whether you're a physicalist or a dualist. And then um, can't remove ourselves from the body. We experience sensations when it is affected, but not when others. And then the last is that you can control your own body. Um, right, Gilberto, yes. You can control the motions and movement of your body, uh, but you can't do that with others. So I can just command my hand to snap the finger. But no matter how like hard I stare and look at a person and think about it, I can't will their body to do the same thing. Um, I can make them want to do it on their own or something, or I can threaten them or something and make them do it that way. But I can't, you know, like through thought, produce the action. Okay, good. So reasons to have a clear understanding that you do have a body. Perfect. So now we're done with Descartes, and we're talking about the physicalists. So supervenience physicalism is question 62. Supervenience. There's an example that is used to explain the concept of supervenience. Let's start with that. What's the big example that the author uses to demonstrate that concept? Supervenience, think of a blank. Certain type of uh, image is the uh, standard example there <clears throat> of the concept of supervenience. So we explore and explain supervenience with what kind of example? Daniel Stoljar talked about it. Um, physicalism says everything's made out of uh, matter, everything is physical. So what is this attempt to explain what that means? There's an example that has to be mentioned in any discussion of supervenience. So what is that example kind of about? Supervenience. I know it's, it's like a piece of philosophical jargon. Um, but we did cover it and we did talk about it, so we just need to bring that back up. <clears throat> now, I don't want you to get like lost in the sauce trying to like think of the right answer. I just want you to be able to tell me what kind of example this answer requires. And then I can take over and help you go from there. Um, but there is a basic sort of thing that he says we can compare the universe to. And this gives us the um, understanding of supervenience. So what's this thing that the universe is compared with in the supervenience discussion? <clears throat> and I've already said it's a certain type of picture, so I mean that's, I hope, really giving it to you. <clears throat> okay, so Sherry, yours says two pictures of the same scene, but you gotta talk about the dots, and you can't just say pictures, because who knows what they're made out of. If it was brush strokes or something, wouldn't be the same. You gotta have little discrete um, elements. So, Gilberto, we can compare the universe to a dot matrix. Okay, perfect. So, what's a dot matrix? Somebody's gotta tell me that. What is a dot matrix? Definition. What is that? <clears throat> We're on the right track. Dot matrix is the starting point. But I just wanna kinda open that up now. What is a dot matrix? If you can just say. Yeah, but you can't, I'm asking you what it is, so don't use the word anymore. <laughs> Just tell me what it is, in other words. What is a dot matrix? And it doesn't have to be of sun, sea, and birds. That was an arbitrarily created example by me. It could be of anything. So you're saying it's like pixels on a screen. Kind of, yeah. Uh, it's the image that the pixels make when they're all combined, yeah? So a dot matrix picture is just a big picture, but it's made out of a bunch of little bits that are dots. In the case of a dot matrix that's printed on the page, those are ink dots. In the case of digital image, like on your screen, those are little pixels that form a big picture. Now, in every dot matrix picture, there's like global features. Global feature is just a term which means a large scale aspect of the image. 
So, I mean, if you put, if you press pause on this video right now, or I mean, I forget pause, like just watching it, right? Like my glasses or just me, this person shown on your screen, that's like a global feature of the image displayed on your screen. My watch could be a global feature. This cell phone on the table or the whiteboard behind me, that would be like a global feature of this dot matrix. Now, all the global features are the outcome, the result of the little bits being arranged in a particular pattern. So now we've got to get to the thing about having two. If you have two dot matrices, which are exactly the same arrangement of dots, then they have to have all the same what? Can you complete that sentence for me? If we have two dot matrices, each with the exact same order of elements, of parts, then they would have to have the same, what's the term? Same parts, same what? Same global features, correct, Alberto. So same order of parts, same large scale features. Different global features, different distribution of parts. Okay, now that whole situation I just described about the dot matrix picture, how it's built out of little bits and how if you had two of them with the same part arrangement that have the same holistic features, that is supposed to carry over to the discussion of the physical universe. So the physical universe could be seen somewhat as a parallel to the dot matrix because our universe is something, according to physicalism, that is also made out of tiny little pieces. But what are they in the realm of the physical space we're in? Now we're not talking about ink dots nor pixels, but what is the stand-in for those things in space? We would call them perhaps term what? the equivalent of the dots of the dot matrix are atoms of space, correct? So similar to the dot matrix, this universe is a big structure which is built out of tiny parts that are atoms. So same as with the dot matrix. If there were, uh, Shauna, so I was looking for the term uh, atoms, right? Atoms are like the most fundamental unit of matter. So now, if we had two different universes, but that they had the exact same atomic distribution of atoms, then they would have to have the same exact global features as well. So if you could imagine a secondary universe that's got exactly the same order of atomic particles, then in that universe, it would be exactly parallel to ours. There would be a copy of you and me and this meeting and everything happening in the world uh, because all those events are global features in the matrix formed out of atoms. So um, that governs the existence of all the larger things. The tiny pieces of matter build the big structures from them. And consciousness is part of that. So the thoughts, feelings, and mental lives that we're living on the physicalist picture, they're just the result of the uh, atoms composing them. And if there were a duplicated physical universe, then the consciousness exhibited by your doppelganger would be exactly just like your own, okay? So there couldn't be different thoughts in a physical copy universe. That's supervenience. Okay, so, <laughs> kitty, good girl. Next up. Um, Just trying to get it here. Okay, so Stoljar's distinction between interpretation and truth question. Interpretation and the truth question. Those are two questions that can be asked about physicalism. So let's just simply say what those are. Daniel Stoljar talked about those. So the interpretation question and the truth question. Question, what are they? The question is, what are the questions? So what is the uh, interpretation question about physicalism? And what's the truth question about physicalism? I'm, I'm just waiting for your response. So once I see it, I'll, I'll help uh, explain a little more. So interpretation question and truth question. So good, Natalie. What does it mean for what does it mean to say that everything is physical? Yeah, that's the interpretation question, so that's correct. And the other one, is it true that everything is physical? Exactly. 
So Gilberto, you say in both. The interpretation is, uh, no, no, uh, sorry, Gilberto, that's not actually correct. The interpretation question says, what does it mean? That's the first part of the question. What does it mean to say that everything is physical? And then the other one asks, is that true that everything is physical? Okay, so your wording is a little, uh, it's, it's almost there, but yeah, you can see the, the slight uh, correction. What does it mean to say that everything is physical? Interpretation. Is it true that everything is physical? When you say, is, is it true that everything is made up of physicalism? Physicalism is a, um, a belief that everything's made out of matter. So <laughs> physicalists would not say that everything's made out of beliefs. They would say they're made out of atoms. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, to answer the interpretation question, he says you use supervenience. And to answer the truth question, he gave two arguments that I think we're going to go over just now. Okay, so next up then. Um, the methodological naturalism argument about physicalism. What's the argument for methodological naturalism that he gave? That's a, that's a pretty simple argument, just two premises that lead to the conclusion. Um, tell me what those were. Kitty, she's really happy today. I don't know what's going on with her. But anyway, yeah, it's a good kitty. Methodological naturalism argument. Daniel Stoljar gave this. It backs up physicalism. It makes it sound like it's true. Um, two premises then there's a conclusion that follows from them. Something about what's reasonable to believe. That's a hint, if, if that helps. So let's just see what, what you guys have on this. What's up, Katie? Methodological naturalism argument. Just keep in mind which one we're talking about. <clears throat> okay, it is, Gilberto, you're giving it. It is reasonable to believe us. So when you write an argument, though, you should not give a conclusion at the beginning. The conclusion is what's stated at the end after the word therefore. So you would provide the premises first. And only after the premises should the conclusion be written. I understand that in everyday speech, though, sometimes we do it the other way. Someone will say, like, America is the best because we've got the most powerful military. So, like, you give the conclusion first, and then you say because, and then you offer the reasons. But in, like, in the standard form of logical argument, we should provide the reasons first and then give the conclusion afterwards um, just as a piece of uh, format. So, Sherry, it is reasonable to believe what is believed by the methods of natural science, premise one. But there's more to the argument. So after that, what's the next premise? You got the first one right. It's reasonable to believe what's believed by the methods of natural science. I guess if I sort of combine Gilberto and Sherry's response that it's all right there. So let me just say it through. Premise one, it is reasonable to believe what is believed by the methods of natural science. Premise two, physicalism is believed by the methods of natural science. So therefore, simply, it is reasonable to believe physicalism. Why? Well, because the premise he said, because it's reasonable to follow science. Science believes in physicalism. So if you believe that too, you just get to kind of piggyback on the rationality of the scientific community who does believe that. Okay, so it, the argument just says, what scientists believe is reasonable, and they're, just, they're all physicalists. So if you believe that too, you kind of inherit the rationality and reasonableness of the scientist's position. In my view, though, that's not the most interesting argument for physicalism to be true because it kind of says just follow the lead of other people who are really smart. Uh, it doesn't say that you should be able to, like, come up with the reasons for yourself. But the other argument gives you, I think, a better argument. So next up, um, the argument from causal closure. Yeah, so let's talk about that one. This argument has three premises that lead to the conclusion. So let's just try and state some of them if we can. Causal closure argument. Um, let's see if we can get the information out there so we can talk about that. We're making good progress, I think, in terms of time. Uh, yeah, you know, we've got 
like 15 more questions or so. So we'll, we're definitely going to finish a little early. But part of that depends on you, how fast you can respond to my questions. So causal closure argument. Um, every event which has a cause has a physical cause. That's the first premise. Good. What's the second premise? Every event which has a cause has a physical cause. And then... Second premise is, is key. Every event that has a cause has a physical cause. I need a little more though. That's just one part of the argument. Every event which has a cause has a physical cause. No problem with that, but we need the whole argument. So what's the next premise? Sherry, I figure you got it. If you wrote the first if you wrote the first premise down, then you'd be in a position to see all the full argument wherever wherever that's written. <clears throat> okay. Um but you're skipping the second premise. Do you not have it written? Every event has a cause. Which has a cause has a physical cause. But then you just jump right over the second premise. Is it not written down? So anybody else can tell me. Let's get the argument written out in the right order. So uh, sure, Sherry, but I still don't see that you've written the second premise. I know there's a lag. Is it going to show up? Because it's still not there. Here's what you wrote. Every event which has a cause has a physical cause. And then you just say, if an event A causes event B, then there's no event C, which is different from A, and which also causes B. But that's still missing the second premise. So it's not, you know, it's a, you're skipping the main point. Uh, oh, oh, it is up there, so it didn't come through. Never mind, well, that's fair. So mental events can cause physical events. All right, good. Let me, let me get, give you the uh, information in a really clear way. Premise one. Okay, now the third premise is what you wrote. Um, So I just wrote the argument out so that it's clear, um, so everyone can see the, the structure and the order of the premises. First premise, every event that has a cause has a physical cause. So if something happened, if some event occurred, of course something physical had to trigger it. Um, otherwise, how could it possibly have happened? So things require a physical cause. So every event which has a cause has a physical one. Second premise, mental events can cause physical events. So like if, if I say, want to raise my left hand, it just goes up because I'm making it happen with my mind. So your thoughts can uh, produce your physical behaviors. That's all that the second premise is saying. Thought can lead to an action, whether it's snapping a finger, speaking, raising one's hand, or doing anything with their body. Now the third premise is key because what it says is, um, Sorry for the small typo, now I see it, but it should say the first word if, that's the only thing, the letter F missing. If an event A causes an event B, then there is no other event C which is different from A and that also causes B. Um, and that's exactly what you wrote up there, Sherry, except you do have it correctly written with the word if properly spelled. 
So the third premise is just saying that when there's a cause of an effect, that that's the only cause of that effect. So every effect just has one cause, not two, not three, just one. So putting these premises together, the conclusion that comes out of it is, therefore, mental events are physical events. Why? Because, okay, um, every event that has a cause has a physical cause. Your, your mind being able to compel your body to act, the physical cause there is the brain sending signals to the various parts of the body to do the actions with the muscles, right? The third premise is saying that since the brain is the cause of your behavior, there can't be any other cause of it, too. It's not like it could possibly be the brain plus some other mysterious thing that's separate from that. So, in other words, your mind, which causes your behavior, is just the physical brain causing the behavior. And there's no room for anything else to be the causal basis of those effects. Okay. So, what we have now is um, nomological dangler. That one, I think, is also pretty straightforward and clear. So what's a nomological dangler? Has to do with science, something that JJC Smart mentioned in one of our last meetings. Um, so what does the word nomological dangler or phrase term nomological dangler refer to? Nomological dangler. Hmm. What kind of thing is that? But yeah, so when scientists cannot explain, well, we can't call it discovery. It's actually the opposite of a discovery, like not knowing something. It's not discovering anything. So it's just when there's something that cannot be explained by science, something that remains unexplained by the physical sciences. Um, now, J.J.C. Smart talked about that word because he is a physicalist, and he thinks, well, there's no such things as nomological danglers. Um, Everything can be explained by science, if not today, then eventually. And so he denies that consciousness is one of those nomological danglers. If dualism were true, then the mind would be something that's weird and spooky and can't be really physically co uh, comprehended because it would be something that's outside the realm of physical things. So JJC Smart believes, never mind that, there's just brains, there's just brain processes, that's what consciousness is, that's what experiences and sensations are. It's nothing more than that. So from JJC Smart's perspective, consciousness is not a nomological dangler. But again, he mentions the term because he knows that if dualism was true, which he disagrees with, if that was true, then the mind would be more like a soul or something, and then it would be outside the realm of scientific and physical explanation. Okay, cool. So uh, we're on to 67. In JJC Smart's article, he talked about this objection that a dualist might make to the claim that sensations are brain processes. So remember, JJC Smart's major uh, thesis in his paper is just sensations, which are conscious states, all that they are are brain processes playing out. And that's a physical thing playing out. So there's nothing other than the physical, even when it comes to the mind, which is the only thing people think is not physical. Um, so back to my question, just making sure. Yeah, so what's an objection that's being mentioned here? Someone says back to JJC Smart, wait a minute, no. Sensations can't be brain processes because, and here's the objection, a man may know nothing about brain processes. Elaborate on that. What's this objection going for? It says a man may know nothing about brain processes. Can you uh, expand on that a little bit, give me some nuance there? What's being talked about in this uh, question about the essay. A man or a woman, whoever, may know nothing about brain processes. What's the larger argument that that's trying to gesture towards? <clears throat> Let's see if you can tell me a, bit, a little something about that. And if not, then at least tell me what about it I could help you with. Okay, so Sherry, you say, they are not aware of how the neurons and such fire to cause us to behave the way we do. Yes, but there's kind of like this, um, this contrast that he actually mentions. He says, we can talk about this, but we can't talk about that. And this is supposed to disprove the assertion that sensations are brain processes. So you have to refer to those two things. You're close. But so far, all you've told me is that 
we don't know anything about what's happening in the brain. That's half of what he says. What's the other half about what we do know how to speak about? So we have no problem talking about one thing, but we have great difficulty talking about this other thing. We'll get to that, Sherry, but that's about the response. The morning and evening star thing is how JJC Smart kind of claps back against this objection. But I'm trying to get the objection stated first. So a person might not know anything about the brain processes, but they can talk about blank. One thing a person can talk about, one thing that they can't, good, sensations. Um, definitely you're sticking with the language of the author, which is fair, but I think most students will be like sensations. What are those again? So sensations are your everyday conscious experiences, like feeling bored that you still had a lecture, or feeling hungry that you still haven't eaten dinner, or feeling a little fear and anxiety that you could get sick um, with a terrible disease. Okay, so sensations could be anything. Happiness, sadness, pain, um, excitement, fear, you know, um, eating stuff, playing music, listening to music. Every conscious state that a person can be in is what he calls a sensation. So the objection to his claim that sensations are just brain processes, the objection to that, the pushback against that, is that, well, people can talk about their sensations, and they do, but they can't say anything about their brain process, and they don't know what it is. So how could those two things be the same, right? If I tell you that I went on a run the other day, and I had a great run, and I was really running fast, um, and that I was kind of tired in the middle. That's my explanation of my experience. But I could never tell you, oh, and like, and neurons were firing over here in this frontal cortex, and then there were like dopamine receptors over here generating the, the runner's high. You know, I, I don't know any stuff about that, even though I have basic familiarity with the concept. So how could they really be the same? If talking about your experience is no problem, but talking about the brain is a huge difficulty, then how could one claim that they're actually the same thing, which is what JJC Smart is claiming, okay? Now, Sherry, uh, I think since you like the morning and evening star example, you could probably jump right into this. The next question says, what's the reply that he gives to that same objection, that a man may know nothing about brain processes? So how does JJC Smart try to still say that even though we can't talk about the two things, they're still the same thing? What's his response to that? And it does have to do with the example that you're talking about, Sherry, so take it away if you've got the right answer. What's the reply to somebody saying, sensations are not brain processes, because I could talk about my sensations, I have no idea what's happening in my brain, those are not the same thing. What's the reply to that, the rebuttal to that? <clears throat> so now we got a physicalist, JJC Smart, and he's like, no, sensations are brain processes. Your objection still doesn't work because, or it fails to, to disprove my claim. What's the reply? And it's yes, involving the morning and evening star hypothetical. Well, it's not a hypothetical, sorry, it's a real case. So Sherry, they are the same thing even if one is not aware of the difference. Yeah, but that's the example. Please explain the conceptual point and then refer to the example. That's always the logical order of things. You talk about the, gener the general and then you move to the specific, right? So like if I wanted to say um, people in a pandemic um, tend to hoard things, right? I would say that first and then I would say, for example, look at the 2020 COVID pandemic or another example, look at the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. But I wouldn't just say, hey, here's a picture of people hoarding stuff in 2020 and then after that, I mean, you, you can do it either way, but usually you move from the general to the particular. Okay, so, but once again, Sherry, you're doing it again. You're, you're talking about the example, but you have to set up the example and give context, right? So like in the larger sphere of things, there can be two different objects. Um, sorry, there can be one object which is referred to by two distinct labels. Um, and even in such a case, that doesn't mean that there have to be two things. So like there could be two words for one object even if a person does not have awareness that they refer to the same object. That's the like generic, generic description of his response, which doesn't even make reference to the example itself. Then the example kicks in. Okay, so 
repeating myself. There can be two words or descriptions for a single object, even if the person does not know or understand that they refer to the same thing. For example, the morning and the evening star. Okay, so now I'll track your comment. Uh, there were, but once again, you have not, you know, you, go, you jump in a little too far. You have to give the definition of the two things. So what's the morning star? The morning star is the brightest star seen in the morning sky. The evening star is the brightest star seen in the evening sky. At one time in history, people believed truly that they were two different objects. And now, like one man looking at the morning star, another man looking at the evening star, tell each other about it, don't realize it's the same star. Yes, but it is. So similar to that, sensations and brain processes don't exactly sound like the same thing. And a person could think that they're two different things. But even if that's true, it doesn't mean that they actually have to be two different things. So having two terms or labels or descriptions for one object doesn't require that there actually be two objects. And the morning and evening star is a clear example of that. There's also lightning and electricity, which he talks about. Lightning just is electricity. Maybe somebody doesn't know what electricity is, but they can talk about lightning. But that does not mean that they're not one and the same. So similar, maybe a person can talk about their experiences, but they don't know anything about the brain. But just like lightning and electricity, that's still the same thing referred to in two different ways or described somewhat differently. So let's not think that language forces us to judge that there are two different things um, when there's two different words for something. Okay, so then uh, now we're on to Turing and the uh, imitation game. So tell me, what is the imitation game? First of all, uh, this so-called game was invented by Turing in, in order to test whether machines have consciousness whether computers basically could ever think like we think and have feelings and thoughts like we've got. So if this question was asked, I would just hope that you could kind of describe to me how you would set this game up if you're actually going to have someone play it. So how would they do so? Um, you're going to set up a Turing test. So what are the materials and how is the game played? What's winning, what's losing? Just Talk about the rules and the setup for the so-called imitation game. Let's hear that. <clears throat> so what do you have on this? Imitation game. It's a way to try and judge or evaluate whether a machine has consciousness. And so that's just my question. How do you play the game and how do you set up the game? materials, and then the procedure. So how is this game going to be set up and played? Alan Turing, computing machinery and intelligence, the famous inventor of the digital computer. He stated the imitation game, and now you need to tell me about it. <clears throat> Just giving it a moment. I know it takes a second to say. Okay, Shauna. A person has to interact with two parties via type behind a wall, and that person will have to figure out who they're talking to, a computer or a human. Absolutely, yes. If they guess the computer is human, they lose, right? Now, when does Turing think that computers have achieved consciousness? At what point? What would be the... Uh, achievement that they would have to make before he says that's that's the right conclusion. Machines have achieved consciousness when what happens in these games. <clears throat> so Shauna, that's very good. You've told how the game is played. Yeah, when the interrogator misidentifies about half of the time, exactly. So when whenever we get to a point in history where People who talk to computers can't tell whether it's a computer or a person, no matter what questions they ask. If you can't tell, meaning that you get it wrong roughly half of the time, then that would be, he thinks, the day where computers have got consciousness and where they're thinking like us, where they've got minds like we have got. So, um, so that's basically it. Set up the imitation game, 
you know, run it through and see if we ever get computers that can trick the interrogator to think that they're the human, um, at least around half of the time. And he believed that it's inevitable, that it will happen someday, that it's just a matter of time. Of course, in his day and age, in the 1950s and stuff, he was nowhere near that day, but we're a lot closer today. Just think of like, you know, Alexa or Siri or any of those things, um, voice assistants, and then um, on into the future, you can imagine even more realistic chatbot and um, artificial intelligence systems. Okay, now, so there's some objections to Turing though, and that's what the next few questions deal with. Um, one of the objections says this, <clears throat> A machine uh, doesn't have consciousness because it can only do what it's been programmed to do. What was his response to that? So someone says to Turing, this imitation game doesn't prove nothing because no matter what happens in it, the computer's just doing what it was already programmed to do, and that's not how humans operate. How did Turing come back against that? Just let me know. So yeah. Machines, computers, they can only do what they've been programmed to do. Humans, not that way. Now here's Turing. Wait a minute. Turing says back what? What's the Turing rebuttal? Turing's response, his reply to the argument that machines don't have real consciousness because unlike us, they can only do what they've been programmed to do. So what is said in reaction to that by Turing to defend his position? that they can have consciousness. Okay, Sherry. His response is that humans are programmed as well, but we call it learning, not programming. Yes. They're the same thing. We cannot do or think about anything that we have not learned. Right. Um, if there's a language that you don't know today, then you're not able to speak it today. Uh, but if you take on a course of study in language, then after having access to the vocabulary and the grammar uh, and focused on it, now then you'll be able to speak it. But... Um, Information has to be given to you before you can act on it or to interpret it or examine it. So, um, like, none of us were thinking about the coronavirus last year because it didn't exist yet, and that information wasn't available to our mind to think about. Uh, of course, there were other previous pandemics and all those kind of things, but we couldn't have been thinking about the nature of this current thing until something happened that we could then take notice of. So human beings can only think about new ideas when they encounter the new ideas from some external source. Um, like a baby born today can't speak, but if it gets the right kind of input from outside of it, then it will learn that ability. So humans, too, like the computer, can only do the things they've been programmed to do. And as you said, Sherry, good way to put it, we call it learning as a human. Um, but it's really not a different concept than having information given to you from some outside source that now you can integrate into your network of concepts. So it's kind of like we're just very powerful computers. Okay, so that's one. That's good. Uh, explain Turing's response to the idea that a machine can only mimic conscious behavior but doesn't really have any feelings or sensations. What about that one? Um, the machine, the computer, is not really exhibiting actual, like, for real consciousness because whatever it says in giving answers or whatever it does in terms of its behavior um, does not correspond to any actual thoughts that it's having or any feelings or experiences that it has because um, it's just syntax, you know, it just outputs a string of symbols um, which we interpret as the answer but which the computer has no idea what's doing at all. So can you remember what he said back against that? That there's no real thought happening inside the computer and that's why it's not actually conscious no matter how well it does in the game? What was Turing's response to that, if anything? So the idea was given that um, they don't really think inside. They may behave like it on the outside, and it might look like it when they talk or when they do whatever. But when you speak or when you um, interact, you're having thoughts and feelings that are mental. But you can argue that the machine doesn't have any of that internal stuff going on. It's just behavior on the outside, but nothing internal. What is Turing's response given to that, if anything? He does have a response. So what is it, though? The machines just don't think, really, is, is the nature of this. It's like the objection from consciousness. It's Lady Lovelace's objection. Hmm. Or no, it's the objection from consciousness. Lady Lovelace's is that they're doing what they're programmed to do. But uh, 
But anyway, you heard the objection. Despite the outward behavior that you could observe, there's no internal character of mentality or thought. Uh, yeah, no, it's not that one, Sherry. Um, it's a different one of the objections mentioned, but that's that's in that's in the mix. But it's not about this particular question. Um, it has to do with like first person access to consciousness and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's a little bit of a hint which I'm saying in a little bit of uh, elevated language to give you still something difficult to think about. So um, they say the computer doesn't really feel inside, but we do. Now what's wrong with that objection to the thought that machines could have consciousness? The objection again that they don't really think or feel, but we do. Shall I uh, offer you something or is I just don't know how to interpret the, the long pause as we wait for some information to come back. It's a pretty recent lecture, so I thought maybe some of you would have this, but one way or the other, we'll get it out there. Uh, you got nothing for me on this one? Well, okay, let me jog your memory. So, uh, but hold on, Sherry. There you go, right. We cannot know that anyone or anything has consciousness except for ourselves. Right. So for you to evaluate whether other things have consciousness, not you, because you obviously know that Descartes, of course, would tell you that's something that it's the most obvious thing that you know that you have consciousness. But do other things out there have consciousness? Well, they seem like they do, like humans that you interact with. But can you really prove it by feeling their thoughts? No, because you can only feel your own thoughts and experience your own thoughts um, from the internal uh, first person perspective. So when it comes to everybody else besides you, the only way you can judge if they have consciousness is to look at how their behavior is and see if it sounds like or looks like that they're conscious beings. So he says then the same is true of the computer. Um, you don't have any more access to its consciousness than any other person's consciousness. So when it's behaving in a way that exhibits all the features that we think consciousness would, why should we doubt that that's consciousness? Unless you're so skeptical that you don't even really know for sure if any other people outside of your mind have consciousness. Okay, so the only test for whether things can think and feel is behavioral test. Because to feel the feelings, you're limited to the one person that you are in terms of having those feelings and experiences. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. Got just a few more now. Turing's response to the mathematical objection. First of all, what is the mathematical objection to Turing's account? The mathematical objection says that for certain uh, technical reasons, there are always going to be certain questions that a computer could never answer, and that humans are different from that. Um, Giddy, all right? Okay, got to hold on one second. Yeah. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> So question again, let me get back to what I was doing here. Yeah, mathematical objection. So for certain technical reasons, there are always going to be questions that a computer could not answer, but you might think that's not the way human brains work because a human can always come up with some type of answer for whatever the question is. What was the response Turing gave back to that? Uh, well, his response to this one was, Again, it's kind of like the one about how you can't do anything other than what you're programmed. And then he said, oh, the human brain's the same. Here he says there are also some questions that a human brain could never answer. Um, so we're not actually different from the computer on this score. Like if you try to answer the question, uh, does the universe have a beginning or not? What's the largest number? These are questions that you'll never be able to really fully comprehend an answer to. And so there are also limits of the human brain in terms of giving answers to information questions. Um, so we're not actually a different breed than the computer. Um, they have their mathematical limits, and we also have our own computational and conceptual limits. They're just things that we don't often think much about. Okay. So now we're on the very last topic. Just a couple questions about this. Uh, this is all now about what makes a life go well. And last week we discussed um, two authors about that. There was Plato and Sartre. So starting with Plato, what did he say would make life go as well as it possibly could go? What's the basic blueprint 
um, according to Plato, that we should follow if we want to have the best life you could possibly have. You know, if you want to live your best life, what did Plato say would be the recipe for that? What would be the basic plan? Best life according to the Greeks, according to Plato. You got to do something, but what is it? Now, this is the last week lecture from seven days ago, so hopefully a little more fresh in the memory. Um, I know we've got a small crew here, so I know you're doing a lot of heavy lifting, guys, but it's all to your benefit. Um, but let me hear from you. What do you say? Once again, Plato's account of the good life. What is it? Uh, hmm. Well, I mean, that's one way to put it, Shauna, but it's way more detailed than that. A lot more detailed than that. we got to talk all about these different parts. Soul. Okay, so Sherry. So he defined three parts of the Republic and the soul. And everyone should do their part and stay within their system. Same for the soul. Yeah. But again, um, the devil's in the details. And this is not detailed enough. Uh, so I understand, though, that there is another question after this that maybe you're holding off on because that's where... There's a more specific question about the soul and the state. But let's just co go over all of it now so that we cover as many of these things at once as we can. So, okay, what are the three parts of the Republic? Right? No, that's correct also, Michael. Yes. Uh, but let's take it slow, yeah? Three parts of the Republic. Uh, let's do Republic first, then we'll connect that to the soul afterwards, Sherry. That's a good question. So in the Republic, some people are blank. Other people are blank. And then you have, okay, so merchants, warriors, and kings. Kings, yeah, I see. Merchants, their job is they're producing goods and services that people trade and sell for profit in the market. So that's the biggest, largest class. That's all the people working a trade or a craft and making money off of that. The second group are the warriors. Their job is not to produce goods, but instead to provide defense. So they're like military or police they secure the state against invasion and protect it against like riots and internal division. And then you have the kings. The kings are the leaders. They're the ones that um, run everything. They're like the heads of the state. And um, so anyway, there's those three parts of the republic. Who should be running everything? The kings. And uh, the other parts should do their job too, but they should not try to challenge the rule of the king. They should each be peacefully submitted to the role that they're doing. He also says there's a virtue of each of the three parts. A virtue is a quality that if the thing has it, it's able to do its function or job very well. So the virtue of merchants is to be temperate, to have temperance, which means that they have self-control and they don't get too greedy. The virtue of the warriors is to have bravery or courage, so they're willing to fight and face danger if it's needed. And then the virtue of the kings is um, wisdom, because if they're going to make policy – and if they're going to lead the state in whatever direction, then they have to be intelligent enough to make good and careful decisions, right? So when you got temperate warriors, sorry, temperate merchants, courageous warriors, and um, wise kings, then the state will run well, and they all got to defer to the king. Now, the soul has three parts too, so let's make that connection. What are the three parts of the soul, uh, guys? So good, you, you told me what the three parts of the republic are. What are those three parts of the soul uh, that compare to the three parts of the Republic? <clears throat> three parts of the soul, what, what, and what? <clears throat> Let me know. Three parts of the soul definitely has to be mentioned. We're halfway home. We talk about the Republic and the parts that it has. Okay, good. Appetitive, spirited, and rational. And a little description here. The appetitive part of your soul is like the part of you that wants stuff and that has desires, and as they're called, appetites. So things that you want and the, the, you hope that they get fulfilled. The, the spirited part of your soul, uh, no, I think that's all spelled correctly, actually. So the spirited part of your soul is the part that has um, passion and pride. It's very competitive. Um, 
It likes to win, it hates to lose, doesn't want to be disrespected. That's kind of like the warriors. The appetitive part is kind of like the merchants. And then the all-important rational part of your soul is like the, um, the kings. That's the part of your soul that should lead. Um, and so if the three parts of the soul are in the same harmony as the republic, then that's a good life. So if your wisdom and rationality is ruling and your appetites and spirit are um, supporting it and doing their job, uh, but not trying to interfere with the jobs of the other parts, then that's a life well lived. That'll produce good and just behavior and um, imbalance among the parts of the soul or granting too much power to the inferior uh, appetitive or spirited parts, allowing them to run the show, that could lead to unjust behavior and um, corruption of the soul. So try and do for your soul the same as what's done in the ideal republic. Appoint to position of power your reason, allow it to preside, have all three parts doing their job, but according to their virtue, and then that would be the best case for you. So that's what Plato believed. To answer that, then, we've covered a few things. Um, 73, talked about the harmony and balance. 74, we talked about the analogy between the different parts. Now, 75 and 6, they kind of have a connection also. So tell me, why did he say that nobody could benefit from injustice, even if nobody knew about it? So why does injustice not benefit you, um, even if it's not discovered by anybody or anything? Um, tell me about that. Yeah, so he gave a metaphor of a three-headed creature to help make his point here. So let's go into that. What are the three-headed creature that did get discussed by Plato? Because that's his example he uses to drive home the point that injustice cannot benefit you even if, like, let's say, nobody ever knew about it. So what's this three-headed creature situation? Tell me the heads, and we can go from there. I know one of the heads is, like, ambiguously described as a section with many. So with that little nuanced fact, um, keep that in mind, I guess, as you, as you try to give me the information. So, yeah, three-headed creature... Metaphor, example, what is the three heads? <clears throat> Let's just see, we've got it. Okay, good. So, Sherry, one head's a large one with many small heads coming out of it. That's the appetitive part, right? And uh, I kind of think of them as like little gargoyles because they're described as beasts that are hungry. So there's one section, yes, of a bunch of little snapping gargoyle heads. What is the other two? Okay, so we got our gargoyle section. Other than that, we've also got what? So you got to write about the, the small ones that are appetitive. The other one is like a lion, and that's the spirited part, the sort of proud um, fighting warrior part of you. And then the third part, which stands for the rationality, that's the human head. Okay, good. Now he says this. Suppose that when everybody else looks on, like outside observers, when they look at this being, they only see the normal looking human head. So, hey, how are you? Oh, good to see you. Like they just see a human head presented to them. So nobody can think that there's anything it's too strange. But imagine that behind the scenes, there's this actually going on, that the human head is being dominated and enslaved by the other parts, that the gargoyles are lunging at it and trying to bite him, and that the lion is also overwhelming him and causing him to cower in fear. If that's what's going on inside of this person, then they're not living so well, even if everybody on the outside just sees a healthy looking human presented to them. And he says, this is the cost and the price that you pay for being unjust. So while you're going around ripping people off, lying to them, stealing, trying to always get ahead by cheating and nobody finding out about it, you may be thinking, wait, this is great. I'm living a great life. But what's actually going on inside of you is like you're feeding your appetites to such an extent that they go out of control and you're um, feeding the passions and pride within you and your emotional um, states to such an extent that they get out of control 
and now your reason is becoming weak and it cannot exert any influence over your behavior. So the rational part of you, like that voice in the back of your head that's like, but is this really a good idea? You're causing it to become very weak and very um, powerless. And that's actually the most human and godly part of you. So you're kind of enslaving the best part of you and you're boosting up and empowering the lower parts. Now you're also putting them at war with each other because your reason keeps saying, here's what I ought to do. But it gets reprimanded by these inferior parts of the soul that shouldn't be controlling everything. So he says, basically, you set the parts of your soul at war with each other when you don't put them in the right type of harmony and balance and allow the humanity within you and the reason within you to rule. Um, so nobody benefits from injustice. They might think that. They might think, well, I'm getting away with it, so who cares? But it's not about other people noticing you doing it. It's about what happens to you inside on your inside of your soul. So do it if you like, but you're going to pay a price and um, you're going to corrupt the most godly and divine part of you for the lower and inferior parts. Okay, so that's like kind of uh, 75 and 6. And now I just have a couple questions for you on the last author, which is Sartre, existentialism. Um, <clears throat> what's existentialism? Can you just give me the big motto of the existentialists? They say something precedes something. What is that statement? And then we can expand on that. Existentialism claims that something comes before something else. But what is that statement that is uh, that I'm mentioning here? Blank precedes blank. That's like the, the fundamental statement of, of existentialist philosophy. What precedes what? Okay, existence precedes essence. Good. Now, Sherry or anybody else, I want you to please try and expand on that. What does that actually mean, though? It's easy to write three words. It's a little harder to try and, try and explain it, like as though you're telling a young person that doesn't know anything about this. Existence precedes essence. You walk up to the average 14-year-old and be like, huh? So tell them. Tell them. What are you actually saying, though? You know, like, that's my job. I got to tell you what these philosophers with all these deep thoughts really mean. Uh, so put yourself in my shoes if you can. What is existence preceding essence saying at all? <clears throat> we know precede is to come before. And I think you, I think you have a clear enough memory of uh, this discussion from last week. Existentialism is, I always think, one of the topics that people latch on to, they find interesting because it speaks to, you know, stuff about your own life. Um, but yeah, existence precedes essence, meaning what? Okay, existence precedes the attributes that define you, right? So good. When you start off existing in this life, you don't have an essence yet. The essence of a person is just the core defining attributes of that person. So in my case, I would tell somebody I'm a professor, I'm a philosopher, uh, I love music, I love travel, um, I love reading books, um, I don't know, politically, maybe center left, um, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you talk about the, the core identity that you have and what it's like. And so Shauna, good addition. They say that the essence is created over life by your choices, by your free will. So it's not given to you by outside forces or factors. It's not like your essence is just handed to you on a plate and you just live according to that. You create it and you're totally free in the creation of it. So when they say existence precedes essence, they mean that you, know, you live, but you create and shape your own identity according to your will. That's a good comment for sure. Um, so you create it over time through your actions and through your free choices. That's the core idea of existentialism. To add to that, they also say you got to own it. you got to take full responsibility for the essence. So since you're the author of the way you are and it's your creation, this being that you are, then you shouldn't blame other people or other things for it. You shouldn't say, hey, it's not on me. Like, take it up with, I don't know, my genetics or my parents or my neighborhood or uh, my teachers or something. According to existentialism, you're ultimately in the driver's seat, and you're the captain of the one life that you're living. 
So you have total control and authority over it and you can shape the essence and you do shape the essence to whatever you want. Okay, now that bleeds into the next question. Uh, what's the concept of bad faith in existentialism? Kind of has something to do with what I just mentioned where a person's got total responsibility for their essence. But sometimes people don't like having that, taking that responsibility for their essence. So what is bad faith? That's kind of setting you up. Bad faith is when what happens? <clears throat> yeah, what is the bad faith concept? <clears throat> Bad faith, something that I guess Sartre and that school of thinking says you should not engage in, but people generally, they do it a lot of the time anyway. What is it, this bad faith concept? <clears throat> bad faith. What's bad faith? Okay, so when you try to place responsibility for your essence on on outside external factors that you could not control. So yeah, it would be like someone saying, you know, I'm this, uh, so Shauna, you say pressure from social values adopting false values. Uh, no, no, uh, it's not about pressure because according to existentialism, you, you're never under pressure. You're totally free. You can see the society you're a part of and you can say, I reject it completely. Or you can say, "Never mind, I like it and I want to be a part of it. So you could be the rebel or you could be the follower. You could, you know, do the things that your parents did, or you can completely reverse that. So that he would insist that you're totally free. So Sherry, it's kind of like what you're saying there, which is that um, sometimes people try and shift the responsibility to out outside things. They say, look, I am this way, but I grew up in a certain type of household, and that's what made me this way. Or I'm this way, but you know, I had some friends, and their influence they had on me made me be the way I am. The existentialist would say, no, you just got to look in the mirror. I mean, you chose the friends. You either chose to follow your parents' example or to rebel against it. You either chose to identify with the norms and customs of your age and your fashion, or you decided not to. So you're just totally personally responsible for your essence. You're free, but you also have to accept the responsibility for your freedom, you see? So that's the overall picture that he's trying to shape and describe. You create your essence. Don't think that it's anybody or anything else that does it. And any attempt to you know, place that responsibility away from you and on other things would be a case of bad faith. Okay, so um, why did Sartre say that each individual man is responsible for creating all of humanity? Why did he say that? What does he mean when he says, when you create yourself, you're also creating all mankind. Can you make sense of that for me? How is creating your one individual person and your essence anything comparable to creating all of humanity? So we've covered that first part, that you create yourself, and you're totally responsible for it. So you've got to own it and not engage in bad faith. But, uh, you know, well, you heard the question, so let's see. I want to get your response. <clears throat> Creating all of humanity, what does he mean by that? Obviously, it's not literally true. You don't literally create all of humanity. But what does he mean? Like, what's the sort of kernel of truth in the statement that you create all of humanity? Or what is the sort of metaphorical truth behind that idea? If you create yourself, what does that have to do with creating all of humanity? <clears throat> okay, so you're like a template of how you think humankind should be, just by being the person that you are. Absolutely right. So um, people who make choices that are the same choices you made, they get uh, your approval in terms of those choices. So like... If you became a parent, like you chose to have a kid, right, and somebody else says, you know, I'm going to have a kid, you'd have to think that that's a good decision because 
it's the same decision you made. And the fact that you made it means that you think it's a good thing for a human being to have children, right? If you end up pursuing your college education and you graduate and you get your degree, right? Then if anybody else in this world tries to go to college and get a degree, you think that's a reasonable choice because it's the same choice you made. And by making it, that verifies that you think that it's a valuable thing. So every choice you make that shapes your essence from the biggest to the smallest ones reflects the kind of person that you want to be. And since you want to be that kind of person, you also believe that that's a good general way for any person to live. So it's not so much that you literally create all of humanity, but you create one human person yourself. And that stands as your legacy to the world of how you think people should live. So you can see your own example as being kind of like the model that you uh, place in this world for others to follow if they wanted to. Okay? Um, good kid. <laughs> like a cat does not create its essence, you know, because according to him anyway, they have no individualism, they got no free will. But I don't know, this cat's like pretty special, so sometimes I wonder if that's really true. Okay, anyway, going on. Um, Sartre says that we're condemned to be free. That we're condemned to be free. Now, why does he say that? Well, it's because it's kind of like a catch-22. In existentialist thought, you're free to be anything. Uh, yeah, I, I, she does seem to have an essence, really. You know, yeah, so they say that you're free to be anything. Um, but the one thing that you're not free to do is to not be free. Um, that's just the human condition, having this freedom. He says that we're kind of condemned to be free because sometimes the freedom we have is a little scary, right? Because you have this awesome responsibility over the establishment of your own being and your own essence. Um, you're put in this world to shape your essence in whatever direction that you want, but you cannot escape your freedom. Um, it's given to you and it's a condition of being a human being that cannot be avoided. Why would you ever want to avoid it? Well, because it's stressful making decisions with your free will. Just think about little decisions that you have to make. What major should I choose? Should I marry this person? Should I not? Where should I live? Should I have children? How many? Uh, you know, what kind of uh, profession should I enter once I do achieve my degree? Now, when you're making all those choices in life, and you inevitably will, and you are making them, uh, you want to make the right choices. But to existentialism, there's no fact about what's the right choice because each one of us has our own perspective on what the best life is that we put into action by making our own selves be what we are. So it's sort of like if you want to get off of this ride and be able to stop making choices, unfortunately, you'll never be free of that. For as long as you live, free will is going to be your, your um, I guess, privilege, but also your burden. Because some of us would probably like to be able to say, can I just live like this cat and not have to choose anything anymore? This cat doesn't make big decisions. It's not choosing a major. It's not choosing, you know, where to live, what political values to have. Should I be religious or not? Um, should I be more a humanities, more a science person? Um, you know, should I serve in the military or should I just, you know, work in uh, the government? So all the millions and billions of decisions that a human has to face, an animal like this, for better or worse, it doesn't have those thoughts and worries. Sometimes we'd like to be able to get off of this cycle of having to make decisions with no objective basis, but that's something that cannot be done. You're burdened with your freedom. So in his mind, it's like freedom is liberating and interesting, but it's also kind of a little scary and uh, oppressive. And that's why he says we are condemned to be free, us humans. Freedom is our permanent condition, and we're forced to be that way. Now, Camus and some other people talked about like suicide, um, that humans have this unique capacity that other animals just don't seem to show of being able to like decide to end their lives. And uh, some people think that um, like, oh, I didn't choose to be born, right? Uh, but Sartre says that even that is a choice that you are making right now because you could always make a decision to end your life if you really didn't like what you were doing or you didn't like the fact that you're alive which I hope nobody ever does choose to do because your life has you know, the most value and it's the most precious thing. But um, anyway, if you are alive right now, it's because you're choosing to still be alive because you have the ability to end your life if you really wanted to. So even the fact that you're alive, maybe not the fact that you were born, that's part of the facticity, 
But the fact that you're alive now is a choice that you're making. So everything is free will in, in a human life, every little aspect of it. Sometimes the free will strikes us as a great um, liberating thing, and other times it seems like a burden that we have to carry when we're making tough choices about what we think we should do without any objective basis, at least not according to existentialism. So we can't escape our freedom. We gotta live with it. Best to try and, uh, I guess, take an optimistic attitude towards it instead of be pessimistic or cynical, thinking that, um, thinking that it makes the human condition too difficult to bear. So yeah, I mean, that's all the questions uh, we covered in the second half of the study guide. I was wondering whether I should ask about 81, because I, I did actually briefly discuss it at the tail end of the last meeting, but that wasn't, I don't think, enough discussion overall to justify it. But just for fun, 81 says, why is death bad at any age? Nagel said it's bad at any age because no matter how old you are, whether you're young, middle-aged, or even old, elderly, um, you want to hang on to the goods of life. You want to keep experiencing more. Um, and if death prevents you from having any kind of experience afterward, then the deprivation and loss of the goods of life is what makes death a bad thing at any age, even at an advanced age. But I'm not going to ask 81, so that's just me talking to you for the sake of rounding out the discussion here. So look, guys, we've come a long way. Uh, we covered a lot of territory in this class, um, and I really think that it's been an interesting semester for all of us, right? I mean, something we'll never forget um, going through this. But I really appreciate all you guys' hard work throughout the semester. I know that attendance is up and down, and as we're getting close to the end, and this is a night class, it, it's something I expected. But uh, the group that's watching right now, it's a great thing that you guys stuck with it. and. Um, I really appreciate all your hard work, and I'm wishing you the best, uh, not just in this class, but on all the other things that you're going to pursue later in life. So uh, let me know if you had other questions as we get closer to the final next week. It's next Thursday at 6. I'm going to send you guys the test form uh, by 6 p.m. on that day, and you'll have three hours to write uh, the answers and send it back as an email attachment to me. I'm going to be grading your essays this weekend. They'll be done before the final for sure. Uh, I'm going to try and make sure they're done, like, no later than Tuesday at the latest so that you can get your score uh, before you go into the final. So I'll be in touch with you over Canvas um, so that you can know when it's done. And yeah, just send me uh, this essay by email if you've not done it yet. I, some students were asking me about that. Um, but yeah, standard thing for me would just be to send it by email. No other submission method is um, available for, for my class. Okay, guys, so have a great one. I really do uh, appreciate all the hard work that you guys have put in, like I said. And um, we'll always have this memory of this semester. So when things come back to normal, uh, stop by and say hi. Hopefully that happens in the next year or so, even though I think the fall is going to be more online learning. Um, I'm teaching critical thinking in the fall. Some of you guys, if you're interested in that topic, you may decide to, to take that class. Um, so anyway, you can consider your options. but. For now, anyways, thanks so much, everybody, Michael, Sherry, Shauna, Gilberto, and everybody else here watching. Uh, it's been great, and I'll be in touch. So we're not done yet, though. Study hard, and let me know if you need any help, and we'll be good on the final exam. All right, then. Have a good night. See you soon.